Nick Hilk circuit at the moment in the wet. Back to second. Usually we'd be third. Ease on the throttle. Try and get some traction. Back to second for turn two. Use as much curb as you possibly can. Carries heaps of speed up to the most important corner on the track, onto the back straight. Three big wheel spin. Second, third, fourth, fifth. Exciting part of the circuit, this one. Try and get a toe on someone down the back. You'll pick up a couple of tenths. Six back to fifth. Now it's wet, so we're in fourth this time. Carry heaps of speed through turn six into a very difficult braking zone down here into turn nine. Dandy Road, good opportunity for a pass. Feed on the throttle, trying to keep it nice and smooth. Bit of wheel spin, third, still wheel spin. Last braking zone, and it is possible for a, uh, a pass into this section. Onto the front straight, another very important part of the track to get it right. Come on, you can line someone up here for a pass into turn one and over the start finish line. Cheers, guys. Hope you enjoyed the lap. We did enjoy the lap. Thanks, Lee. And thankfully, the weather's got a whole lot nicer today than it was on Friday when we put that together. So an interesting grid. And already confirmation that a couple of the big names will start this race as primary drivers. Down the order in 21st, Shane Van Gisberg and Craig Lowndes is, we believe, aboard Car 888 for Caltex entry. Up the front of the grid, off the front row, Richie Stanaway and Alex Premer. Championship scenario with McLaughlin leading the championship. 13 poles, six wins. He reunites with Alex Premer. Perjek Enduro Cup winner from 2016. Remember the Win Cup's now the all-time winner in supercars. Let's have a look at the lineup. Waters and Stanaway, the Triple M starting group from McLaughlin Premer. Second row of the grid, David Reynolds and Luke Gilden, Jamie Wincup and Paul Dumbrell, both former winners of this race. Chaz Mostert and Steve Owen, the super cheap car. Then it's Tony Alberto and Fabian Coulthard, Dale Wood and Chris Pitha, Garth Tander and James Golding, Mark Winterbottom, Dean Cando, Nick Perkat, McCauley Jones, the youngster gets a run. Michael Caruso, Dean Fiore, Lee Holdsworth and Carl Ryan. Well, Lee just took us for that hot lap. Rick Kelly, David Wall, James Courtney, together with his old friend Jack Perkins, continuity with that pairing. Scott Pye and Warren Luff, that's a new combo. They're celebrating the 1994 livery of Brock and Mazira. Slade and Walsh, beachy colours on that car. Further afield, Aaron Russell, Taz Douglas, Alex Rulo, Alex Davison, Shane Van Gisberg and Matt Campbell. There's a big story. Jason Bright, Gary Jacobs from Dunlop Super 2 driver. 1,075 races between Craig Lowndes and Stephen Richards coming into this and at the rear of the field after damage yesterday, Jonathan Webb, Will Davison in the Techno Auto Sports Woodstock car. Isn't it interesting, Neil, we spoke about it when we first came into the commentary box about A, the front of the field and the championship battle. Prema just in front of Dumbrell and that year-long battle we've seen with Scott McLaughlin and... Jamie Winkup, only 12 points separates the guys at the front of the field. Huge pressure on the co-drivers. But at the other end of the field, would you have started Shane Van Gisberg? And that was the point that you and I were discussing. And in terms of limiting the risk, they've chosen to put Van Gisberg in early. And I think that's a smart call, particularly as he's going to be able to deal with traffic. He'll storm here and become a factor very quickly. Let's get back downstairs. Pivotal point in the championship. We love this stage of the game. Coming into the Wilson Security Sandown 500. Some people thought that the monster Ford may have been dark horses. There are a real chance this afternoon. Stanaway has immersed himself in that team. Watch that combo with Waters. Absolutely. Those guys will want to win, win their first Sandown 500. But looking at the back of the grid, as you guys just spoke about, Shane Van Gisberg and Craig Lance in those cars, they will be making early passes and getting track position. There will be something to watch. It's retro round. Welcome to yesterday. <laughs> Some beautiful livery. <laughs> Fancy dress for supercars. First event of the Pertec Enduro Cup. Wilson Security Sandown 500. Row one, Richie Stanaway, Kiwi International. Dirty side of the road, Monster Energy Ford Falcon. He shares with Cam Waters. Also on the front row of the grid, Frenchman. Second in the race last year, Alex Premer shares with champ leader Scotty McLaughlin, who's not had a podium at this racetrack. Row two, Luke Gilden, 18th in Juro campaign. 
great job in the race for the grid one. He's with David Reynolds. Paul Dunbrell, twice a Sandown 500 winner with three-time race winner here, Jamie Wincup, green flag. Race 19, 161 laps, 500 kilometres, the Wilson Security, Sandown 500 gets underway. Great start, Stanaway. Kremer runs with him. Yulton tucks up the inside on the dirty side of the track on the left. And Dumbrell looks racy as well. That was very close in terms of all four cars getting away similarly. There's some chaos down the inside. That's Van Gisberg. You can see in the back of shot around the inside of Slade. Oh, off the road goes Cantor. A little bump. And that will be... Can he get it back down to there? I think he will be, and that's the spin. So that's Ash Walsh. He had contact with Van Gisbergen in Slade's Freightliner Commodore and leading at the end of the back straight. Lap one, Richie Stanaway. Great job by the young Kiwi. So two cars in trouble early. Dean Caddo in Mark Winterbottom's car, the Bottolo entry. Ash Walsh, car 75 in the Brad Jones entry, the Freightliner car. It's push and shove as it always is down the order and we've got more trouble with a car heavily yeah, into the, the tyre barrier at the end of the back straight. Yeah, just kept turning me and turning me. I got a puncher and just hit the wall. Taz Douglas has hit the wall. This will trigger a safety car. Are you all right, mate? So the safety car boards and flags out already. Second day in a row that we've seen trauma in this area of the racetrack. Van Gisbergen has got to 13th position, Neil. Didn't want you to do dry laps this weekend, apparently. Now, some people may use this opportunity to actually squeeze some fuel in just for a top-up. That's actually going to take quite some time to resolve. Cam's race control. There's Michael Massey, Craig Baird, Tim Schenken, all sitting line astern in Cam's race control. But that's now the third major incident that we've seen at Turn 6 this year this weekend, which clearly, every time you repair it, it's hard to get it back to its original structure. Shades of last year, James Golding last year. Remember, we actually had to red flag the race, which was the first time it had ever been red flagged and then went through a restart process. So here's the replay. We can understand more of what's happened here. So uh, Douglas has just gone straight ahead. I heard him say that he had a puncture. There was contact with somebody, and he's gone straight ahead into the tyre barrier. It sounded like from his radio comment that someone was into the back of him and kept on turning him. So I have to try to work out who was with him and what the contact was. But there's Cantor, fortunate for him to get out of there. A and B is now on the end of the queue. So here's the start because it was a very even getaway. Beautiful start. All four cars at the front, very close. And he moved over just to the inside slightly. Stand away, good job. And one of the Nissans got stranded. I think it may have been LeBrock. Now check out what happens with Van Gisbergen. He's just down the back here. He's on your right. He's in behind. That's down the inside of Taz Douglas. He actually gets that done. And then he gets to the back of the Tim Slade Ash Walsh car. Now what happens now? You can see Canto off. Where's the contact with Ash? I think that might have been the contact with Taz Douglas, actually. That might have been the right front that's caused the damage. Riding with Van Gisberg, and there's the stranded LeBrock Nissan. That's Taz Douglas in the orange, blue and white car off to the right. Lowndes goes down the inside in the Caltex entry. Ash Walsh is in the Norm Beachy colours. So does Gizzy make also some contact here as he shoots down the inside? He may have just snipped the right front there as yep. he went through turn two. Yep. So Shane's just got the hot knife through butter okay, going red here. Flag, red flag. And uh, the red flag has been called as we safety car, lead cover the cars off. around. To... And some cars have pitted. In fact, there's been five of them that have pitted. Walsh, Jacobson, Russell, LeBrock, Cando and Douglas. Well, have a look at the ground he's made. He's got two guys in the back straight there because it's going to be a really good run out of turn four. And a little bit of side drafting got a run there, Van Gisberg. And so, as I said, he got to 13th position from the back of the field. Now, take a close look because the front's reasonably calm and reasonably sane. At the back, it's not. So, where you see Van Gisberg and down the inside, it's three abreast. They bump each other. Canto, in the meantime, is off the road. Now, check out the Norm Beachy mobile because he gets a bump and a subsequent spin for Ash Walsh. Now, I think it's actually Taz Douglas that's into the back of that car. 
Now, whether he actually turned him or not, this will tell a better story from Craig Lowndes. So he's been usurped by his teammate across the inside. Now, watch this. A little bit of bumping. And a little bump, little bump, little bump, little bump, little bump, more of a bump, and turned him around. So that's the end of that. There's actually about three or four, maybe five, moments where you could assign potential for a puncture there, either at turn two or three or four, and this is the net result. So, as harsh as it is, he's sort of done that to himself with that right hand front damage, and what's actually gone on there with puncturing the tyre, we still don't really know as to what the actual cause was, which one of those contacts was severe enough to hurt the tyre, but at the end of the day, Taz Douglas in car three for Lucas Dumbrell Motorsport in the fence. And as you can see, for the first time since last year, but we first time ever, we've had uh, the race suspended with the damage to the wall at turn six. So a couple of people did get a gulp of fuel. Jacobson, Russell, LeBrock and Canto to try and take advantage. But now we've got a race suspension. So they'll come back onto the start grid area and uh, park up because it's going to take some time to resolve the issue with the fence at the end of the back straight. Race suspended sequence, and that may also have an impact on time certainty uh, at the end of the day here as well. And spare a thought for our officials and uh, volunteers who have worked so hard through the course of the weekend. You can see that car already on the back of the truck to come back into pit lane. But these people have now made... This is the third, but the two incidents so far this weekend at Turn 6 have made a lot of impact, a lot of damage to the background guardrail. You can see the guardrail where it's moved, all the tyres that are out of there, the conveyor belt around the front. That's probably the most amount of damage that we've seen through the whole time there, Murph. Just catching up with Frosty down here, looking at the fence and uh, talking about the time suit probability of this race. But, mate, um, how, do you how do you explain the start? Uh, he, Not that you had anything to do with it. No, nah, he's, he's had a bit of a bad run with that um, turn four the last couple of years here, unfortunately. But thankfully it's on lap one. We didn't go down a lap. And um, if for some reason the car's not getting off the line, we're probably, you know, I think both of us are probably two of the best starters in the, in the category. And um, we both had problems with it. So, you know, I put him in that position yesterday with a bad start. He got a bad start again then. And, um, yeah, just a bit of mapping that we need to tidy up. So we're in the, in the back now. We've filled her up full of fuel. And... Uh, we just got a soldier on now and get back out of it. Yeah, it didn't look like any damage when it came in, which was fortunate because it uh, slid across the grass there, but it's just uh, the frustration of it all, isn't it? Yeah, it's, um, it's what these long races are, you know. You, you work your backside off and it can all come undone pretty quickly, but thankfully you're just going to stay in the lead lap. That's the big thing. Uh, we can get back in this race. Um, you know, it's, I think the car's pretty good. We showed yesterday qualifying fourth. It's, it's quick enough, uh, but 24th on, on track now bit of a, a coffee break or whatever they call this when they fix the fence and uh, and we'll go again and just try and get back up there. Thanks, Ross. Cheers, Tom. It's been a tough deal for him down there at Turn 4, Dean Cando. That's him right at the back of the group of cars down there just surveying the damage, the rear of it. Looked like he and Jack Perkins got together pretty heavily down there, Mark. <laughs> yeah, they looked like there was uh, contact from Turn 3 up to Turn 4 and Jack was into the back of... Dean Canto's Falcon, and off to the right he went. He's a little bit unlucky last year because he was caught on a slick tyre at that spot. There was a lot of other guys that went off the road at the same position. So, uh, as Frosty just said, probably in terms of year-on-year -year bad luck, Dean Canto's been part of that. The incident there, car three and car 75 at turn four. And this is always unsettling for the drivers because you get yourself into one of the biggest races in Australia. You've got your brain around the start, you've made the start, you've got on with business. And then to stop and get back out again, you almost have to totally re-prepare very hard mentally to get yourself back into the state. The anxiousness before a race like this is always very intense and difficult to get your brain around this scenario. Cars on the starting grid race suspended here at Sandown. They are permitted to work on the cars. They're not permitted to refuel at this point. And a few will be looking at odds and ends of damage because that mid pack and beyond gets crazy on the opening lap. So if you've only just joined our coverage, there was a lot of congestion and trouble between turns two, three, and four. Taz Douglas has made contact with several cars down there. 
when he did get to the end of the back straight, turn six, right front tyre was either flat or going flat, and it's pitched him off the edge of the road down there into the wall. That's Alex Premier, the Frenchman, who shares with championship leader Scott McLaughlin. With Paul Dumbrell, third in the queue in the Red Bull Holden Racing Team entry. Car OK so far. I know it's really early days, but is there anything in this little stoppage that you'd want? Not at the moment. It's probably a bit, easy, a bit uh, too early to tell. And, and to be perfectly frank, with where the weather is now and the heat today, uh, or now, it's going to be a lot cooler later on today. So, hey, we'll push through what, with what the car is today and hopefully we come home strong. Mark Scaife was just saying about what this does mentally to a race driver. You've been around the game for a while now. You're 35. You've been doing it since you were your late teens. But do you have to reset? And how do you reset for this sort of situation? You still like you until you told everyone my age. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, um, yeah, absolutely. It's one of those things. Uh, it's funny, Sandown has been a few, uh, few red flags over the years, but uh, it's, it's pretty normal. Lap one, you know, we sort of restart. So it's a new race, safety car restart, uh, I would assume anyway. So, um, hey, we'll just put our heads down and uh, not let it bother us. A great start there before in the battle with Luke Yulden. Any observations on the two in front, the 17 of Alex Premer and the monster car of Richie Sanaway? Uh, no, I had to hold myself back to make sure I didn't swap any paint with, uh, with uh, Alex. So, uh, no, uh, obviously a good guy and uh, we look forward to a good battle later on. OK, thanks, Peter. No worries, thanks. Tim Slade, sitting back here. Um, tough start for you, though, with that car. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, unfortunately, Ash got turned around. Um, we are starting sort of towards the back anyway after um, we had a little penalty yesterday. So, yeah, not the end of the world, and, and we managed to get in and, um, yeah, top up with fuel there. So I think that should help us later in the day. But, um, yeah, hopefully they don't shorten the race too much because of this stoppage because we need uh, all the time we, we can get to, to make our way back forwards. Have you seen a replay of the incident? And just give us your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think it was... Just one of those sort of opening lap, opening few corners type of thing. Um, it looked as though sort of Taz had a nudge from from someone else, and and that sort of put him into the left rear of our car. And Ash probably would have been on the gas, you know, getting ready to to go out of the corner, and, and just yeah, got turned around. So um, yeah, I think it's one of those things, unfortunately. Hopefully, plenty of time to make up some spaces. I just want to move over here. I'm going to limp over here, Tim. Oh, there's no chair for me. Drag one over, Tim Blanchard. Obviously, you guys don't have a car in this Sandown 500. How tricky is this, or how hard is this day going to be for you and Todd to not partake in the race? Uh, yeah, it's obviously uh, pretty, pretty frustrating sitting back and watching, but yeah, not, not much we can do about it now. So we'll just uh, sit back, relax, and uh, yeah, cheer, cheer the rest of the BJR cars on. Can you give us an update on the chassis back at the workshop and, and what will happen to get you guys back out to Bathurst? Uh, yeah, we've obviously got a great team here at BJR, so uh, you know, they're working on another, another chassis already, so the guys are back in the workshop today and, uh, yeah, it'll be full, full steam ahead the next few weeks getting that ready, but, you know, this team's done it a few times this year, unfortunately, already, so I'm pretty confident they'll have everything sorted well in time for, uh, for Bathurst. Without embarrassing this guy on to the side of you, how impressed were you yesterday when he got back in the car for that Super 2 race? Yeah, I didn't really believe him at first. I thought, well, when saw him in the medical scene, he's like, oh, you know, how long does the Dunlop Series race starts? Need, need to get out there. That's a bit, bit keen, but uh, yeah, no, it's pretty impressive. He's obviously, you know, fighting for a championship, so it's critical that he got back out there. And uh, yeah, I think he's lost, got a lot of fans up and down pit lane now for jumping back in so quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's pretty hard to turn left when you're being pushed and forcing the car to turn right. You can see the damage on the right rear corner there, mate. Uh, that's a pretty tough one. Yeah, look, I, uh, I got a pretty bad launch off the line and uh, dropped a few back. And then uh, the old Constantina effect, you know, into, into turn four, I was up behind Fiore and didn't want to make contact with him, but the guys behind me had other thoughts. So um, as I saw the back of his car, and I'm starting to turn left. The car's pointing to the right-hand wall. And... Mate, I, I, luckily we kept the front off the wall. You know, the back is uh, superficial, but uh, the front's the more important part going forward with the aero for the race. Like many of the drivers in this field, you've been doing this a very long time, and do you think, do you think race drivers will ever learn just to, you, that you can't win a 500k race by turn four? Well, I mean, there's a few guys here that have done this race before, and, you know, turn four is a very, very slow corner, and all the cars can't go in there at once, so... You know, they need to have a bit more of a think about it. Um, we all need to get through that first lap. Unfortunately, it hasn't happened. And uh, here we are stopped on the grid yet again in the red flag situation. Frosty was saying uh, before that uh, you guys have sort of had a bit of a struggle getting this thing off the line in the last, uh, well, this weekend as a whole. Um, it is a difficult process at any stage to get one of these uh, supercars away from the line, but uh, sort of not quite to your liking. Yeah, look, me, my co-driver race yesterday was pretty good against the guys around me, but, I mean, the surface is so worn out here. Um, you know, you get the bite point on the clutch, you let 
go of the handbrake and the pre-launch is okay and then you thought oh I'll give it a bit more throttle but as soon as it flares up there's just no recovery and you know you just watch it if in a replay you'll see yourself and the cars just blast past you but um, look that's what it is and that's what we get paid to do we've got to get them off the line but um, you know we need to work on a little bit of our, our launch procedure to try and make it a little bit better so we're uh, you know 100% hit not uh, 80% hit. You know, we've just, uh, I've just had a word in my ear that uh, they've looked at all that, all the views that they can look at and decided there's no further action for anything out there. Does that surprise you? I mean, it's a, it's a tricky one to sort out, but, I mean, it doesn't uh, help the fact that you, now you're at the back of the grid. Oh, maybe we've got a full tank of juice. Very good to go. But, uh, look, I mean, I would imagine that would have happened unless someone did something blatantly obvious. Yeah. I'm sure they were getting pushed from behind. So um, we press on, and, uh, like I said, it's a, it's a long way to go. I'm sure the race is going to be short now due to time restraints. But um, we'll press on. We know we've got a reasonably fast car, and... Uh, let the guys in the uh, in the pit crew there work out the strategy now to try and get us up the field. Thanks, Tino. Cheers, mate. Both Erebus cars, fourth and fifth respectively in the queue. Luke Yulden, what was the start like? And all that, that build-up to the, the start and you've got to sort of reset again. Yeah, you're right. All that, yeah, as you said, build-up and, yeah, just all that adrenaline and there's all lows again. But uh, I get a really good start. It's a shame I just couldn't do much with it. I think that, the, you know, obviously got a better start than the front row. Thought about doing a bit of a desperate, realised, hang on, 500 k's, let's just back out of this. And uh, obviously we're in a pretty good spot, but uh, how good's Crispy? You must have got a ball terror behind me as well. <laughs> That's a smart play for the afternoon. hope it's a good one for you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so wild. replay of all the madness down between turns one, two, three and four. Red flag race suspended situation at the moment. Jack LeBrock, it is there at the tail end of the field. That car stalled. At the start, right here at Turn 4 is where all the trouble started. So just looking at who did what in the short amount of racing time that we had, Dumbrell moved up a spot into third, but there's a couple of real notables here. Ryan Legain, three spots. Richard Musket went up five spots. Van Gisbergen found eight spots as we look at the replay of the incident. Lowndes grabbed six spots, so you can see the value of the regular drivers. Look at the craziness between Turns 3 and 4. So trying to unravel who was pushing who and where all that started and finished pretty difficult. How Jack got away with that one without any penalty is one of the great mysteries of the world because there's a big gap behind Jack and you can, you'll be able to see it up a little bit. This is all the kerfuffle that was going on with Van Gisberg and, and Ash Walsh and then Taz Douglas into the back. But on the previous shot, there's a, a quite a large gap. I'll try to get that for you again. There's quite a large gap behind Jack Perkins. So watch them come out of here. So stand away, great start. In behind there's Prema, Dumbrell. Now watch the gap. As you see the green car, the Falcon jumps off there. There's a big gap behind Jack Perkins. Jack makes contact with Canto and off he goes. And uh, he's got away with it because they've just cleared him over the race management channel. But he could uh, breathe the big sigh of relief on that one because normally you'd get a penalty for that. There's the damage and a huge impact there for Taz Douglas from the contact on the right front, Murph. So Jack Perkins here. Uh, I'll just listen to your explanation there, Scafie, on, on that incident. Uh, Jack, you were right behind Dino on that situation where the, the green car ended up turning to the right. Uh, what was your thoughts? I don't think I was behind him. I was sort of next to him. Those guys had all committed to ducking down the inside and I was on the racing line and he came across the front of me. It was pretty hard to do anything, to be honest. Um, I can't do the disappearing act, but um, obviously you don't want to be getting in contact on the first lap of a 500k race. But yeah, um, I, I had nowhere to go. I was just trying to keep my nose clean on the racing line. I didn't do any movements on the wheel to turn him around or anything. So anyway, our, our car's not damaged and we're in a reasonable position here. We're just going to try and keep out of trouble for the rest of it. Yeah, felt all right after that. Obviously, the, it hasn't hit the, the steering or damaged the steering in any way. Nah, not at all. It was literally uh, like just behind the, the wheel and then onto the front bar. So n nothing major. Just like I said, not something you want to happen, but feels like I couldn't do anything to get out of that one. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. So still work continuing at the end of the back straight here as they just try and rebuild the tyre barrier down there. They're quite intricate. There's a, it's quite a specification that the Federation International Automobile, the FIA, stipulates to be able to make sure that those tyres are interconnected and they dissipate energy as safely as possible. Simone Di Silvestro, you look very, very relaxed there in, in your camping chair, and I suppose this is something you haven't seen yet in supercars. Uh, no, definitely. So uh, I'm just kind of learning everything for sure. Maybe the race is going to go time certain, so that's going to change it a, a little bit. But uh, yeah, you know, uh, David had a pretty good start, and uh, let's see where we where we go when uh, when I jump in the car. 
question I wanted to ask you. Um, your parents are here this weekend, that, which is great to have them here to, to introduce them to Australian supercars. But have you explained to them that it's retro round and we don't always wear what we, we've been wearing this weekend? Yeah, the, I, I explained it to them because, uh, yeah, the, they, they must have thought that people just wear that in Australia. I don't know. No, no, no. But they're aware of it. And, uh, yeah, no, they think it's quite quite a cool idea. And, uh, yeah, but it's it's also cool for them to come to, to send down here the first time and actually get to see the, the retro round, yeah. What do they, what do they think about supercars? Oh, they love it. My dad was like, oh, you know, it's still, like, proper racing. Uh, uh, there's a lot of, you know, fighting on track and things like that, which you don't really see in many series. So he really loves it and really, really enjoys it. And, uh, yeah, I think that having a pretty good time so far. Great that they're here. Thanks, Simona. Thank you. Just while we're in this stoppage, the team from Super Cheap Auto have done a little bit of work to the 55 of Steve Owen and Chas Moss. You can see some scrapes down the side there. And Steve, the attention when I first arrived to chat with you guys was to the exhaust. It seemed minor, but is everything all right? Yeah, it wasn't really a performance thing, but the boys like to make everything nice and shiny. So it had a bit of a ding on it. So just to take a precaution, we've got the time to fix it. OK, what happened? Just just walk us through where the little battle scars have come from. I know Rod Nash, team owners here as well. Yeah, it's always the case here. One, two, three. It's always, you know, you're banging doors, everyone. And all the boys are pretty keen to, to get in front. But um, it's just the highest risk of the, of the whole race. So to get through, you know, reasonably unscathed, you're always pretty sort of relaxed after that. You've got to do it all again now. That's the, the key thing. Do you take I mean, you've got to buy a ticket to the last sort of 20 this afternoon, don't you? That's exactly right. And it's a bit nicer now. We're under safety car. It will spread out a little bit under restart. It's not as uh, dangerous as the actual start, but uh, yeah, I'm sure it'll be on again. As always, looking cool, calm and collected. Have a nice afternoon. Cheers. Cheers, mate. Steve Owen, he's sharing car number 55 with Chas Mostert. He, he's sixth on the computer timing after this awkward start to proceedings for the Wilson Security Sandown 500. And we're in race suspension at the moment, so the laps stop counting because all the cars have stopped, but the clock continues to run. It will force us into time certainty, and we'll keep you up to date with what it means as it impacts the strategy of this race. James Moffat just relaxing and watching his man, Richard Musket. And there's Richard Musket on the left-hand side there former Australian GT champion. He's driving in Dunlop Super 2 this year. Uh, he's one of the drivers, Mark, when you look at the winners and losers on the opening lap, uh, actually made quite a pile of ground. So he made five spots. So he's now moved up into 11th position. So uh, that, Good job. that's an excellent yeah. performance. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But when you see the chaos in the middle of the field, you, you understand that if you just kept your nose clean, you probably yeah, put right. the white flag up and you're going to make four or five spots. Don't look sideways, <laughs> pop out the other side and bless yourself. Exactly, Matt. Sorry, boys. I'm just uh, talking to Shane Van Gisbergen here, sitting on the ground, relaxing. I just want to get your rating on your start. Um, your 13th from the back of the grid. Oh, it's OK. The start was pretty good by my standards, but Lounsey's still got me into turn one. He's amazing at the starts. But the rest of the lap, I thought, oh, I'll just take it easy first lap. Then Take pick, it easy? Pick, I thought I'd pick them off, <laughs> and then the holes just opened, so I just shoved it in there and <laughs> did put a scratch on it, though. There was a couple. We watched the uh, in-car going down the back straight there and got a bit of a toe down the inside of a Nissan and then pulled alongside someone else. It was uh, it was reasonably impressive, mate. Yeah, I thought he was going to stay, and he, he went right. Oh, thanks, I'll take that one, too. But, yeah, long way to go. And the race is going to be shorter now, so probably not going to work for us um, because, you know, we need to get to lap 80 once Maddie gets in, so that's really going to change it. But... Um, Boys are crunching it now. Hopefully we can make it work for us. The standard strategy is one that just about everyone else has played out. Lounsey obviously has done the same as you. but And we've seen the strategy forever and a day. So taking the punt, you know, you'd have to say at this stage, though, track position has paid off. Oh, it's definitely worth it from where we were. So, yeah, we we'll should still be able to get a few more and then we'll see where we end up. But it's um, going to be hard to win it or podium, but hopefully we can get close. I'll give you a nine and a half out of ten for the first <laughs> lap, boys. What do you reckon? I think it was an excellent performance. I think it was excellent too. He, uh, he, he slid down the inside there. Standing I was worried ball. about uh, whether or not he ended up with some contact there with Taz and whether that contributed to what happened later. But then we answered that question when we saw a bit more of what occurred in turns three and four. Rusty? Crompo, you turn up with a camera and the fun stops. They've been having a little bit of a laugh down here to try and sort of take their mind off things. Michael Caruso and Lee Holdsworth have been pulling accents. Richard Musket, is that what they've been doing? Yeah, I think they're... I don't know what they're saying to Mike, but, you know, I keep out of that stuff. I guess it's focus on my job. Okay, you've had a bit of a bit of a tough morning from the, the Dunlop series point of view. Just nice to get into, into the 500. Yeah, like this morning, had a reasonable start. wasn't the greatest and um, made a good movement to one. Um, 
had track position to two and uh, unfortunate where I was. But um, yeah, have to refocus, have to got another job to do this afternoon and um, had a good start and uh, hope we can keep it keep moving forward. Creeping over my shoulder is James Moffat. We should let people in at home on a new little nickname that's popped up this weekend. They're calling him Meerkat, is that right? Oh, Meerkat, yeah, he's had that for a um, couple of years. GRM lads always like to uh, give somebody a, a, a nickname, so I call him Muskrete because he's a concreter and Muskrete's the, uh, the family business. So, uh, yeah, the boys call him Meerkat, I call him Muskrete. OK, car's been uh, good so far and we're loving. I know there's been lots of uh, chat among the fans about what are the, the liveries that have been the best this weekend and yours has been one of the real highlights. Nice to celebrate uh, your dad and, and John Harvey's 1987 car at Monza. Really cool. Yeah, absolutely. Like we spoke about on Friday in the telecast, it's really, really special to be able to race under one of dad's car's colours. Not something I never thought I'd be able to do and least of all a Commodore. Um, and obviously the, the special history around that car. So, uh, again, thank you very much to everybody at Wilson and GRM that made it happen happened. Richard did a great job then, kept his nose clean, made a good start. Um, it's a bit like deja vu from last year, we're just not in it this year, so um, I'm fortunate to see uh, another good mate, Taz Douglas, involved in that, but I'm um, hearing he's okay, so that's the main thing. Have a nice afternoon, boys. Go get a meerkat. Corley Jones had a busy day. Hey, we had a very entertaining Dunlop Super 2 race earlier on, mate. You were going forward, backwards, forward, backwards. I think you ended up with a penalty, though. Yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely a uh a bit sort of a race. It was there was a lot going on, that's for sure. Out there, it was it was tough work. You know, we, we were definitely moving forward, and then the last lap, uh, yeah, got turned around there, which was unfortunate, and and did have a penalty early. But um, yeah, it was definitely crazy. The Dunlop Super Twos this year have just been. Uh... Yes, something to behold. So uh, the, the highlights reels are, are very, very long. I mean, a lot of you young guys out there fighting hard, pushing. You, you want to win some of these races. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're all uh, we're all fighting for the win out there, and it's and it is tough out there. There's a, there's a lot of damage from today. I think there's a few few accidents, but we're doing a lot of safety car laps, which is unfortunate, you know. But uh, we're all racing hard. Percat car, you're uh, in there starting with with Nick today. Got a pretty good start, but uh, a little bit of a push and shove down at Danny on corner. Yeah, had a really good start. Actually, made some made some spots off the line there, and just managed to place the car right up. And then, uh, yeah, heading into Dandenong Road, had a bit of contact there, and, and lost a few spots, which is unfortunate. But we're uh, I'm happy with how the car is so far, and we'll uh, we'll push forward. Feeling more and more comfortable every time you, you get to do this, mate. Um, sharing cars in the Puget Endurance Cup, it's a it's a it's a big deal. You've been driving these cars a bit now. Is it getting easier? You're still anxious, nervous. Yeah, definitely anxious and nervous. I mean, I don't think it ever gets easier. It's uh, it's always hard out there, but you know, fighting really hard and just learning a lot from doing these. It's it's massive experience for me, and and we'll uh, continue to keep going with it. So you know, heading to Bathurst soon. So that's a that's a big one to to look forward to. It bloody is absolutely good luck, mate. Thank you. Once Carl Reindler found a little bit of rhythm, you found a couple of spots, which was great, but you weren't that happy with your start, is that right? Oh, mate, it was a terrible start. I, uh, I got a ripper yesterday. I was really happy with it. These things are so difficult to get off the line. They're one of the hardest cars I've ever driven in that regard. And this morning, or sorry, just then, I... Um, just couldn't find that biting point. But it looks like everyone around me got a terrible start as well, except for Van Giz, who's coming through the field. Um, yeah, but uh, sort of capitalised where I could, plucked a couple off, just uh, got Dino here before uh, the safety car boards came out and then ultimately that red flag. So heading in the right direction. We know we've got a really great car. We're both really happy with it. Pace is com you know, com comparable between the two of us. So happy days for me at the moment. People forget that... Because you're a co-driver and you're coming in, you don't get a huge amount of miles in the lead up to the event. So getting practice for a start is, is you know, minimal at best during the year, isn't it? Yeah, there's a lot of guys that do other racing. I, I did the six hour at Bathurst earlier in the year, but um, yeah, for most of us, you, you're jumping in. And, and that's the part of the challenge that we as co-drivers especially love is jumping into a car and making it go you know, getting up to speed as quickly as you possibly can. Um, there's no other sport in the world I can think of where you're not training every single day. So, yeah, it's, it's challenging, but we love it. We wouldn't have it any other way, mate. Thanks, Carl. Cheers. Thanks, guys. That's the scene. Suspended race at Sandown. Beautiful skies. A perfect day for racing. Unfortunately, we only did a little bit of it. We got to the end of the back straight on lap one before Carl R uh, uh, Taz Douglas, I beg your pardon, had a mistake at back at turn four. Ended up with, we think, a puncture or at least the tyre beginning to deflate and uh, fired into this wall, which over the years has been something of a hot spot, Mark. This is back in 2005. Simon Wills, big moment for him where...
and uh, climbing over the top of the barrier and ripping into uh, the debris fence. And then 2010, Will Davison, another big one there in the Holden Racing Team entry. Used at various angles, and it's a wild corner. It's a great corner, though. 265 kilometre an hour approach to it. And then uh, Lee Holdsworth here in the Erebus car. That was another big one. So it's been a car magnet and car eater over quite a long period of time. It certainly has, but it's, again, as you described, this was Golding last year with the right-hand front tyre deflated into the fence and huge damage for young James on the opening lap around the outside on board now. Have a listen. Oh, that was a very, very heavy contact. And then yesterday for young Todd Hazelwood, a little bit of contact from Jonathan Webb spun. Young Todd and out into the weeds, hardly any retardation before the fence up in the air across those tyres and everything did a very good job. This is on board now. Yeah, including the new safety cell that the drivers are sitting in for leak protection. This is the supercar on board camera. It gives you another view of it. We're looking from Jonathan Webb's car. The lucky escape was really David Russell there, but uh, not the case for either of those two cars and in particular the Todd Hazelwood car. Check out, watch the blue car here. This is Matty Campbell from yesterday. Just watching this unfold. Very experienced and clever for him to back out of that and watch the drama happen. And this is today. And you can just see him arrow off the road there. He's trying to get it turned. You can see right at the end, he's still trying to get it to go left. And that's always the natural reaction for the driver. But it's a heavy contact. There's no doubt about that. But it's a fantastic corner. It's one of the best corners in Australian racing. Big, fast entry and 185k mid-corner speed. tyre barrier did the job, debris fence did the job. In each of those incidents that we've looked at, everything related to car safety has done the job, and so that's all been a good news story. Dave Reynolds, we better get this race uh, going again, because I think you're about to fall asleep. Uh, yeah, well, there's not much happening. I'm getting a bit tired sitting here <laughs> doing nothing. When we have these breaks, red flag suspensions, how much does that interfere with just the pr processes of, of the team, the strategy? Luke sitting there, you know, what, how much does that have an impact? Oh, not really that much. It just sort of affects the strategy and, you know, how long it takes to, to, to fix the fence and then, you know, if it's going to be time certain, how many other safety cars there's going to be. So, you know, it kind of reminds me of last year. And last year we uh, made a bad mistake. I wasn't going to bring that up, but you've brought it up because, yeah, you were excluded from the race last year, so I'm sure that's been spoken about throughout the team. Yes, we know what we have to do or what we don't have not do, so, yeah, it's all under control now. We know what we're doing. We're a much better team than we were uh, this time last year, and, yeah, obviously our car's performing a lot better. You seem very quiet, very calm, very mellow. Is this a different Dave Reynolds this weekend? No, not at all. No, I just don't have anything exciting to say for once. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll leave you be. Thanks, Dave. Good luck. Thanks very much. <laughs> I'm not sure that these two have got anything exciting to say either. Um, uh, Holdsworth, I'm just wondering, have you seen the Retro Round promo that was done with the, some of the guys dressing up in silly uniforms? Have you seen it? I, I have, yeah. I have. You, can, you, can you try to explain to me what, what Caruso was trying to channel in, his, in the accent he was putting on? Have you got any, you've got, you're a teammate. You know him better than most people. I don't know. Step Pablo carefully, Escobar. Step carefully here because we're right behind you guys. <laughs> step carefully. <laughs> Pablo Escobar, I reckon. <laughs> Winning. <laughs> Mate, it's, everyone knows it. How good is that? Awesome. We've obviously done a good job promoting the event, the theme of Retro Round. What do you guys think out there? Let, like, let's be honest. Seen that guy with the mullet before. How good was that? That's pretty good. Um, I like this baby blue thing going on that you've got going too. Baby blue? Yeah. yeah it's not bad. What do you reckon I should roll this next round? I just like it, and uh, it suits you. It does suit you. The, the, uh, the, it's pretty striking colour schemes that you've got. I'm not so sure about the Preston... Um, what? Preston. What's the word? What's, what's the next Erection. word? Erection. Why is that funny? I'm not so sure about that one, but I like this one. I like your one better. <laughs> uh, off to a decent start. Got any scratches on it? Uh, yeah, there is, actually. We just uh, had a little scratch in the rear bar. Uh, I'm not sure who from, but look... It's a long way to go, so um, glad to hear that uh, Taz is okay after that. We never want to see anyone uh, have a big crash, particularly in that corner. So 
um, I'm sure once the repairs are done, it's going to be back to business as usual. Let's hope so. Thanks, boys. It's a race suspended scenario, race 19 of the championship. 2017 Wilson Security Sandown 500. Only got uh, a small portion of the race conducted before we had trouble at the end of the back straight. This is from the pole sitter, Richie Stanaway in car number six, the Monster Energy Ford Falcon. Nicely through one. And uh, he got to race to the end of the back straight, held his position over Alex Premer and Paul Dumbrell, and then Taz Douglas trouble at the end of the back straight with a deflating right front tyre, pitched him into the barrier and has done substantial damage to the tyre barrier and the fence up there, which is currently being repaired. And uh, so all of the co-drivers are out of the cars, just laughing and giggling on the side of the racetrack at the moment. And uh, you made the point before, Mark, and all the nervous energy that goes into the start of the race and all of the mind power involved in the strategy play, the whole thing just goes out the window and you've got to go completely through the whole reset process. With the guy who won the Dunlop Super 2 round earlier today, fantastic drive uh, for you, Jack LeBrock. It was a good battle, wasn't it? Yeah, no, it was a great weekend for us in uh, Go Get Her Ultima. We um, didn't really expect to probably be, be up the pointy in there um, this weekend, but yeah, we had a great test last week and probably found a few things which uh, probably really helped us this weekend. So uh, yeah, nice no, stoked for everyone. It's uh, good to get back on the on the horse there. It's been a while since I've been on the podium and it's a bit of a shame we didn't get to taste of champagne, so um, we'll have to that later on. Yeah, righto. Now listen, has that time in that car and the connection with Nissan Motorsport here with, with Todd and the team throughout the year, how beneficial has that been in the lead up to the Enduros? Yeah, it's been awesome. I learned so much from these guys. Just um, they've been really beneficial to our DVS program as well, and helping us understand exactly what we need to, to get out of these cars. And uh, yeah, this weekend it's been awesome, especially with the bearing conditions, just to have that opportunity, especially on Friday morning, to get in the DVS car and have a full dry session. There is, um, yeah, it goes a long way. So um, no, really looking forward to going to do the same thing at Bathurst again with both cars. And um, yeah, it's really really great. The warm up this morning was really solid for you guys too, heading into the the 500, wasn't it? Yeah, no, it was good. Yeah, we changed a few things overnight, had a good hard think about it. And, um, yeah, the car felt uh, pretty good there. So, uh, yeah, we'll see what the race brings today. And, unfortunately, I made a meal of the, the start and everything there. So, um, yeah, a bit of work ahead. But, um, yeah, we'll see how we go. Just explain what went wrong there. Yeah, I'm not sure. I've been up and had a look at the data with the guys while it's from the telemetry, so it's a bit hard to see exactly what happened. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It's a bit weird to sort of just cut out on us. I'm not 100% sure exactly what happened. There's um, plenty of throttle and that sort of stuff. So it was a bit of a mystery. But, um, you know, just the way it goes, unfortunately, we'll just uh, move on. Just for the start, it won't give you grief from here on in. There's no concern from the boys there? Yeah, it seemed okay. Once we sort of got going, everything cleared up and um, it was, the engine felt fine after that, but we haven't really probably got into it properly um, since then. But, uh, yeah, I'm sure it won't be a problem. We was, um, was fine in the warm-up this morning. It was just a bit unfortunate, whether it was my error or something else's um, tinkering away there. We're not 100% sure. But, um, yeah, it's right. It's a long race. All right, Jack LeBrock, chip away. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, tough start for Jack having to sit there and fire it all up. This is a replay from onboard car number 88, Paul Dumbrell off the second row of the grid for him, sharing with Jamie Wincup again this year. Continuity in that partnership. And in the interview that we heard from Paul a little earlier, he said, oh, I had to really sort of hold back from getting into any paint exchanges. So he's actually in a nice spot there, able to see all of the stuff that's going on in front and just stay clear of all the trauma. And this is now the inside run with Luke Yeldon. And they all got away pretty similarly, didn't they? They all... Four, four front cars, and they're all alongside there. He uses quite a lot of curb just to avoid any body contact. And there's Dumbrell down the right-hand side. He gives it away by the time he gets into the braking area in the turning phase for turn two. And again, nicely done because he didn't take any risks on board with Alex. He had a little move. I think it might have just stopped just before the light went out. And very even, as I said, between the two front guys. And he just moved it in, positioned the car nicely. When you're not racing a lot, very hard, when you're trying to get your brain around where to put the car and the spatial perception of where that is. And this is Tony Dalberto back behind them. And on your left is Steve Owen in Chas Mostert's Falcon. And in this scenario, particularly when you're not doing it frequently and there's so much at stake, your eyes are darting everywhere. You're looking to the left, looking to the right, looking in the rear view mirror, looking ahead because you want to be racy, not overly cautious. You can't just ignore your surroundings or you trip over stuff and then everybody be on your case about how poorly managed it was. Really is an eyes in the back of the head scenario. This is car number 33, James Golding. It bogged down, lost quite a bit of ground there and then wheel spin when he's thrown it into second gear. 
And the danger when you're up high here down at turn one is if you get forced out there, out in that grey stuff, it's pretty slippery. And of course, whoever's underneath you doesn't want to do you any favours there either. So they want to help you out there, don't they? Introduce you to the grass. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. <laughs> Very easy to make contact with another car at that point also. That's half of the problem, isn't it? About 15 minutes further in delay, we understand, as they continue to work on these tyre barriers. And just a reminder that uh, it will still be the one-third, two-third scenario of the scheduled race distance, so the minimum for the co-drivers will be 54 laps. We will be time certain in this race today, so 4.48 plus a lap local time here in Melbourne. Uh, this is the view from Jack Perkins. Now, Jack got involved in the dust-up with Dean Canto down at turn two, three, four. And uh, there's no action taken on that one. We're rounding up Carl Reindler on the outside here. It's all going on, isn't it? This car's sliding everywhere. It's just people climbing up over the top of the kerb. It's, it's always hard to describe just how frantic it is in the middle of the pack. <laughs> it's Russell Ingle, just uh, frantic. But they're tossing the boys. The boys. We don't condone uh, rock throwing <laughs> if you're at home. But uh, at an official. Uh, uh, unless, at of an... <laughs> unless, of course, it's justified. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Very good point. Yeah. That was said in jest, by the way, everybody in race control. <laughs> Good luck getting out of that, you two. Um, <laughs> I think it's me, actually. Yeah, yeah, big trouble. Uh, I'm with Warren Luff. You know what it takes to win this Pertec Enduro Cup. And stoppages like this just prolongs the day, doesn't it? Well, it does. But uh, this is how Garth and I won it last year. There was a red flag early on. But look, it's, uh, it's not great. Uh, it's good to see that uh, Taz is OK. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, you're sitting here. Everyone's trying to rejig their strategies and work out what's going to happen from here. But look, at the end of the day, you've just got to, once we get going again, <laughs> we've just got to uh, put our heads down and try and drive our way forward. You put your head down. That was Scott Pye then, <laughs> making sure that you're nice and relaxed. Car 02s look cool all weekend, mate, hasn't it? This is awesome to celebrate a, a, an early Brock Holden Racing Team livery. Yeah, look, it's uh, it's great. The fans have really loved it, and everyone on the team. It's uh, it's, it's great to see that livery back out on track again, and we'd love nothing to get it, nothing more than to get it back in the winners' circle. We've got our work cut out, but uh, we'll be pushing hard. Okay, you've had a you know up and down weekend in that regard in terms of, of pace. Where are you at? right now is have you found a few little things it's just a qualifying car that's really letting you guys down at the moment isn't it yeah look i think we had a good race car yesterday i moved forward seven spots and scott had really good race pace yesterday so look it's uh, it's the usual thing we seem to struggle in qualifying but we've got a fast race car and uh look in these longer races where strategy comes into play we can sort of race our way forward probably a little bit more but uh we've still just got to get on top of that car in qualifying if we can qualify closer to the front just makes that job that little bit easier on sunday afternoon you had a great pairing with garth tander he's gone to gary rogers motorsport now, how are you finding working with this bloke here, Scott Pye? <laughs> oh, look, we're getting on really well. It's uh, it's good. We've got the the same seating position now. So uh, with Garth, I had to have sort of like a bit of a bit of a pad sort of behind me, so it, as a bit of a booster seat. So it's uh, look in terms of uh, driver comfort, everything like that. It makes it that little bit easier, and we get on really well as well. And like the same things out of the car. So uh, yeah, looking forward to this enduro campaign. Thanks, Wazza. So more work continues up there, and pretty difficult conditions. It's been raining pretty heavily here in the lead up in Melbourne and so lovely fine day today but just have a look at how slippery and sloppy it is on the outside of the racetrack down there is difficult working conditions for our officials so we're still in a suspended race scenario at Sandown race 19 of the championship waiting for the repair work to be completed on the fence at the end of the back straight Greg Murphy just catching up with uh, my old mate Craig Lowndes here good old days mate remember back in the 90s yeah, yeah. Just to win this race? We did. We were sort of more up that end of the field, not that end of the field. Yeah, I was just going to, we were just talking about your start. You, I gave Gizzy a 9.5 for his one. Did you? You can't, you only made up six spots. He made up eight, so I think you get a, like a, an eight. Yeah, but I made up eight before turn one. He just made them all up in turn two, so. Uh, but no, no, we actually had a bit of a, a laugh about it before the start of the race. I, he was going to be the bull bar, I was going to be the uh, the bumper <laughs> bar, and we're going to go through the field, but he, he's, let me get, he's let me down. I'm, there's three cars between us. There's a gap now. Um, yeah, I mean, the strategy that you guys have chosen 
yep. seems to be working all right, although this uh, shortened race I think we're going to have, um, how do you think it's all going to play out? Uh, good question. It's one of the things that uh, we've got to find out. Obviously, uh, the co-drivers have still got to do their mandatory 54 laps. Um, for us, we, we wanted to start, um, obviously, for myself and for Shane, to get through the field as quick as we could, get some sort of track position. We know, that obviously, there's going to be an overlap between co-drivers and, and uh, you know, the main drivers. So, you know, Richard was sort of confident that, uh, you know, he can get in there and do a good job. But, uh, yeah, with this break and the lull, it sort, of, uh, it sort of hindered us a little bit because, uh, obviously, we wanted to get sort of 20, 25 laps into the... Um, get out of it, obviously put Richo in and, uh, and then run to the end. We love um, the back straight and the, and the corner that uh, leads down through down to Dandenong Road, but it, uh, this weekend it has, uh, it's been one of a little bit of concern, I suppose, but, um, I mean, we'd love the fast corners. We don't want those things to change, do we? No, look, it, it's, it's claimed a few cars this weekend. Um, thankfully, all the drivers that have been involved have walked away from it. Uh, you know, you and I were talking about whether we can bitumise the, the sort of the outskirts. Obviously, the rain here has caused a big issue. Grass turns to ice, and, of course, once you go offline here, you've got to make sure you get it straight to go down to Danny Nine to get that little cut through. But if you're going the wrong direction, you're going to end up in the tyres. So you don't want to, obviously, yeah, as you said, lose that corner. It's a great corner, um, but, unfortunately, it's claimed a few cars. Good luck for the rest of this day. Cheers, thank you. Mark, when I was in the Hino Hub earlier, I was talking about the fact that it's hard for most of the teams to claim AA status with their drivers, and so you've got to play the strategy game according to that. And uh, certainly there's probably a couple that you can nominate where they are able to emulate the lap speed of the primary driver. But just extending that point in discussion, where it becomes difficult when you've got high-stakes races like this is all the little tiny one percenters managing the safety car restarts, which we're going to go through that process. Passing sounds like a simple, simple thing for a professional race driver to deal with. When you're not in these cars all the time and you're in other cars or other categories where the intensity isn't quite there, that's a challenge. All the other stuff, seat belts, uh, seat inserts, safety nets, getting in and out of the car, it's all those other things. So just now that we've got a bit of time up our sleeve, in fact, a lot of it, we can discuss <laughs> yeah. that sort of stuff. And that's what I meant. So it's not casting a shadow on the ability for people to do a lap time but it is casting a question mark over the notion of how you manage all of that small stuff it's such high stake events this one Bathurst and the Gold Coast when you're a visitor in a team oh for sure and it would be like in any other sport you know not playing that much and coming in to play in the grand final or one of the really big events and uh, this is a very interesting race because as we can see there's a couple of different methods of a attacking it oh, no. the one, oh, we've got Garth Tanner now doing camera work that's how bored he is but we've got an ability to have a Van Gisberg and a Lounge start versus a lot of the co-drivers starting and what you said before about the way the co-drivers attack it with all the drama of turn one <laughs> through to turn four we saw lots of contact between cars at that point and then what you do in terms of the strategy through the course of the day is at three stints, do you do the, do the minimise the risk strategy and, and have three stops or do you have four stops? Do you now, at this point of the race, start to consider what unfolds? Because you've still got to do the 54 laps. So there's a lot of um, thinking on your feet required at a race like this and it's very spontaneous. So when you've all of a sudden got to come into the pit area, there's nowhere near the lead-in that you have at Bathurst. You're straight into pit lane, and then it's on. The frenzy of a pit stop is a hard thing to explain. I'm having trouble coping with GT cam here, getting vertigo. He's, only, well, he's really good at this only because there's a higher view than most times. <laughs> That's right. It's a cherry picker. <laughs> good if we had comps to him. It would be good if we had comps uh, In to fact, it. I'm surprised he hasn't crept all over one of the opposition's cars. So take some photos. Take a few shots. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. Zoom in. Oh, that's how they've set that. Here we go. Here he's he is, straight into the Triple Eight car. You need commentary. Yeah. Oh, you got commentary? Well, we're just, I'm not really filming, I'm spying. <laughs> yeah. so we thought we'd come up this end of the group and see what's going on. I think we knew that, didn't we, Murph? Yeah. Yeah, GT, the boys actually had called that earlier. Don't get me on camera. Um, the only thing is, you know, you know you can't keep this footage, right? Well, I'm recording it at home, so I'll see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And when you see it, when you get home, don't forget to fix your hair next time. <laughs> you know we've hit an all-time low. Still suspended here at Sandown. Work being done at the end of the back straight to sort out this tyre barrier. Uh, the drivers are all amusing themselves, some of them playing part-time cameramen down there. Spare a thought for these people working under pressure, ankle deep in mud, 
trying to get these fences tethered back into place once more. Crumpo, they're playing games up there. This suspension has gone for so long that Rick Kelly's actually had to come up here, grab some lunch, and you've sent lunch back down to David Wall. That's how long you've been waiting. Yeah, well, the strategy changes now, so we've got to make sure he's, uh, he's got something to eat. We ordered some pizzas, but they're not going to be here in time, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think. I've even come, uh, come and got some snacks as well, and, and the cameraman's got some snacks as well. How much does this change, the strategy, though, being serious? Yeah, it changes it a fair bit. Obviously, the race is now time certain, so we're starting to lose uh, a fair few laps, most likely a three-stopper. So it uh, means that I think the co-driver will do basically half the, the race distance. So we've um, got to make sure he's ready to do that. He's already done a Porsche race this morning, so uh, he's, um, he's all fine. He had a good clean first lap and ready to jump back in whenever we get the chance to. We're having some fun, but that, that's, that, that's quite a big difference that the co-driver is going to do the most of this race. Yeah, you've just got to change your mindset a little bit. Obviously, the engineers are going through what this means from a strategy point of view, how much fuel we need to take in, when we're likely to stop and stuff like that. So although it looks pretty boring, it's no time for rest for these guys. They've got to quickly think on their feet and work out what's the best strategy from here on. Now, yesterday we were having some fun because your little fella Lex was here and he is out of control. It's not going to be very long before he's in one of these cars. Yeah, he's scary. I was a little bit more uh, laid back than what he is. Still crazy, but he's, uh, he's completely nuts. He's already on the motorbike and, and loving it, so I'm, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> Thanks, Rigo. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Cheers. So, so, so there's a couple of things to consider in this from a strategy standpoint still think of it initially for these co-drivers that are out there the vast majority there's a couple of primary drivers it's a 54 lap stint race race hmm. that they've got to deal with yep. yep and then after that the primary drivers will jump in time certainty will be a factor to the end and then there'll be well, depending on the safety car if there's any other further intervention a couple of stops beyond that so on paper at the moment, it looks like a three-stop race. We'll bring you up to speed with all that once we know what we're dealing with. The stoppage now, in, in the official count, we're coming up to 52 minutes from the official clock commencement of the race. Uh, thankfully, Garth's uh, ditched the, the camera now. Let's have a look at the replay of the start of what happened here. If you've only just joined our coverage to explain what's going on here, Richie Stanaway, nice job. Car number six, Monster Energy, got away nicely from the pole position. Driving with Cam Waters this weekend, cleanly through turn one. Alex Premo did a good job also on the outside, car number 17. Actually uh, went back to second gear just to make sure that he could pop out the other side quickly. A little bit of throttle steering with the car in the mid corner and out the other side. Luke Gilden down the inside there. Paul Dumbrell snuck up a spot into third on the run down to turn two, but back at about that two-third pack mark, about halfway through the field, there or thereabouts, he was on people bumping and grinding cars every which way here and there was a bit of trouble and contact between Canto and Jack Perkins and uh, Canto also did move to the right down there which Craig Baird our driving standards advisor has sent me a note to say that that's how he's determined that where Canto has moved to the right which is why he's saying there's no further action and, and part of that is also just not necessarily knowing who's where in fact, uh, Dean was checking up from Dean Fiore. Dean Cando was backing away from Dean Fiore there as well, just with the congestion at Turn 4. So that's going on every which way, cars all over the place. So a whole bunch of onboards here to show you the congestion. That's always a spooky place right down the inside into Turn 1. We're riding with Craig Lowndes here. There are two of the primary drivers in the field. Everybody else is from co-driver land. And Taz Douglas, car number three, plus fitness entry. He was the one, unfortunately... He gets passed here by Van Gisberg and he gets into the back of Ash Walsh in the Freightliner car. And then there's pushing and shoving through turn four. Somewhere along the line, he's ended up with some tyre damage there on car number three. By the time he's got to the end of the back straight, that's brought him undone. There's the Van Gisberg and lunge, which was a great move. Impromptu, those spontaneous passes catch the others out. There's the push and the shove between Canto and Jack Perkins. And here's the car going off the road very fast. He got a lot of braking done earlier. I mean, he tried to retard the car whilst he was on the road itself. And then after that, as you heard Craig Lowndes say earlier, when you hit the grass like that, it's like ice, it's wet. And now we've got an umbrella man taking Paul Dumbrell down to his car. Do you have one of those now? It's you. 
Did you? <laughs> <laughs> when it's wet, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. When we left the track, it's an in gag, folks, but when we left the track on Friday night, it was hosing here, and my good mate did spring out the brolly. Uh, the true story is he offered it to me, and uh, we did waltz up to the gate together to stay dry. A happy little commentary duo. Oh, sorry. I was, I was uh, distracted there. Yeah. Matt Campbell, sorry. Put you to sleep. Um, mate, uh, obviously a bit of pressure off from there with uh, Shano starting the race back there. So he's sitting watching the master at work coming through from the back of the field. Yeah, that's it. He made a fantastic start and made, made heaps, up, heaps of spots. So, uh, yeah, hopefully when I can get in, I can just cruise along and, uh, yeah, hand it back over where I, where I got it. But, uh, yeah, we'll have to wait and see, obviously. Be interesting to see what happens in this race now. A lot shorter. So, yeah, wait and see. How's uh, the second Pertig Enduro Cup sort of uh, for you, mate? Uh, obviously, you learned a lot last year, carrying it through this year. Different team, different car, different way of doing things. Um, you're just a sponge at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. You know, obviously, still learning lots. Um, you know, I was still quite new to it last year, and I still feel quite new to it this year because, obviously, you know, different car and different team and everything like that. So, you know, still really enjoying it, but still got a lot to learn. And, uh, yeah, just really looking forward to getting in the car and hopefully having a good stint. But, uh, yeah, I'm sure he'll do a fantastic job and hopefully pick off a few more up the road. Yeah, things are going to change a bit, obviously, now with the, probably the time set race. Um, on top of that, though, just uh, the, physically quite a big difference. We've referenced that a lot over the weekend about uh, the different pairings. How's, how is that working for you with having to put the the padded seat in there and, and do the job, how comfortable or uncomfortable are you? Yeah, look, I, to be honest, when I first um, started talking about this, I, I wasn't too sure how it was going to work. Obviously, there's quite a big difference between us, but, uh, yeah, having my little seat insert, it's actually not too bad. There's still a bit of a compromise there, but it's um, actually quite comfortable. I'm not getting any soreness or anything like that. So, uh, yeah, I think it's as good as it's going to get, and, uh, you know, it's obviously doing the job at the moment. Thanks, Matty. Cheers. Thank you. Shane Van Gisbergen. Just getting his suit back on and getting organised. And I said before, it's always hard after a race suspension to kick yourself back into the zone and understand the level of anxiousness that you had prior. You're all ready for the start. You've organised yourself. You've got off on the first lap. He's gone from the back of the field to 13th. It was a remarkable first lap by Van Giersbergen. And this is a very tough racetrack. We've got a great qualifying example from... David Reynolds because he was very fast remember the fastest guy and the way that he goes about driving this car here he's a great breaker of the car meaning he's very good modulating the brake in the important zones and he's very good at using the correct amount of curb you can see the amount of curb that he used there at turn two and three and then the little motocross berm coming onto the back straight this run up here is exhilarating it's one of the fastest corners that we go to and the braking area really important to slide the car nicely. 265k up into turn six. This is where the car went off the road a second ago. He caught it nicely. Beautiful amount of oversteer. Climbed over the curb on the right at turn seven. Gets it stopped over the inside curb at Dandenong Road, Princess Highway. And then get yourself organized for the last little complex. Back to 200k. Slow it for about 115k. Keep braking and make the change direction nice and the throttle modulation again on the way out. Beautiful lap by Dave Reynolds. It was very close to the fastest lap we've ever seen here. And as you can see, Betty and the crew from Erebus, very happy, Barry Ryan, all celebrating the lap performance of David Reynolds. And there's Alistair McVeigh as young David gets out of the car. They're a great combination. Alistair McVeigh used to be with Holden Racing Team. Barry Ryan's been in the industry for a long time, and Dave Reynolds, they've formed a great combination. He's a very fast young man, and the lap that we just showed you was as good as you will see around this place as Betty grabs him and gives him a scruff of the neck style cuddle to celebrate. Rusty? I'm at the Techno Commodore Scapey, and for the better part of our stoppage, Jono, have you been hanging out the back in the truck? You've kind of escaped it all. What do you do in, in those moments? You listen to music? What are you up to? Well, the priority was to get out and go for a pee. So I got that one done early, and then uh, my little boy Judd was a bit tired, so two of us went in the truck, had to sleep for half an hour or so, uh, watched as many replays as we could, and the boys just woke me up and said, time to go racing. So I'm looking forward to getting out there again. Minutes. You've covered off the fine scenario in the coverage earlier today. Most importantly, how is the car? Mammoth job by your crew overnight. In those first few laps, it, it felt OK? Yeah, everyone did an amazing job. It's, uh, you know, disappointing that's what they had to do, but worked through the night, got it done, and car felt really good in the warm-up and look after a very short amount of time in the race it feels good as well thanks Jono 
They've done a very nice job here, the officials. Again, thank you very much for your effort and all the work that you do through the course of the whole season, but they've done a remarkable job to get that fixed for the fourth time on the weekend and just manicuring that so it's not dug up too much before we commence this race, currently under suspension still. So a superb job by the officials and we're getting organised, Neil. We're starting to see drivers getting on board and we'll give you some numbers on what we think might be the wrap. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I think You're writing it down. Writing it down for you. 127, we reckon. I'll tell you what that does. It puts it's a bit of pressure on uh, cars 97 and 888 just because of the way they've elected to do this with their driver co-driver combination. So Van Gisbergen and Lowndes starting in those cars. So we think a 127-odd lap race. We'll confirm that for you. And um, so 54 laps are still going to be completed by the co-drivers at minimum laps for any, in fact any driver. So this is on board with Craig Lowndes on the run down to turn two. He was right in the thick of it. That's Van Gisbergen down the extreme right. They were three wide. Ash Walsh cops a push and shove. This is Taz Douglas in the foreground. He gets under the left rear corner of Ash and turns him. And then ending up with a problem in the right front corner of that car and uh, runs wide, hits the tyre barrier down there. Big delays then as we've gone through a process now that's extended from the official clock commencement of this race it's an hour ago and the other thing that it does in context with your comment is that it actually places more emphasis on the performance of the co-driver in most cases other than Van Gisbergen and Lowndes because as a percentage of the race they're actually they've got a bigger part to play yeah so they've got 54 laps of 127 so the main driver the primary driver will do 73 laps if you stay on that number that you just quoted so again it's always a crucial part of the performance, having good co-driver performance and staying out of trouble and doing all the things that we've already explained. But the, today, they'll play a bigger role. So the 54 laps uh, is the one-third minimum. And uh, on the numbers that I just spoke about before, that's a 73-lap that's a balance after that. So they'll do a couple of laps behind the safety car here. That's Paul Dumbrell, uh, who's won this race. And the driver that he shares with... Jamie Winkup has also been a multiple winner here. Paul's won it twice. Jamie's won it three times. They've had a bit of stress inside Cam's race control, sadly, today. That's been uh, a bit of a hot spot as they've tried to manage this. Michael Massey. Uh, what is Kyle that? in the foreground. Michael, uh, Craig Baird, race director, uh, Tim Schenken further along as well. So they've um, had a little bit to stop and think about pull out the uh, ops manual to go through all the dirty detail. What's going on with Michael Massey's little moustache there today? It's a retro, I know it's a retro round, but it's unbelievable. That'll be that'll off tonight, and, be gone. Come back and haunt you. <laughs> I think you might be listening I to reckon, uh, commentary, actually. Mark, I can see his little face going. <laughs> Mark Dutton's the yeah, winner, winner of the Dead Animal on My Face Award. Yeah, yeah Simo in Craig Lowndes pits not too far away either. There's a there's a there's a fair competition Five going on in pit lane. <laughs> but there are great liveries. <laughs> take the <laughs> take the facial stuff away. The liveries are fantastic. My favourite's the Monza replica for James Moffat, the Moffat Harvey 1987. The three finalists. Yep. The uh, David Reynolds mobile in yep. the Brock livery from 1976, mm -hmm. the L34 Tirana. Uh, car number 75, the Freightliner car, unfortunately involved in all the troubles, the 1970 Monaro HT. It's a pretty groovy colour scheme, and remember Norm, a special guest here this weekend, Hall of Famer, two-time Australian touring car champion. And the car that you mentioned, the 1987 car of Alan and John. Alan was here yesterday. I bumped into him, spent a few minutes with him. Larry Perkins was up there as well. Both legends of our sport. Great to have them here for such an important weekend. Hopefully we can get back now to some serious high quality racing and put on the show that we desired. Now some of the Tim Schenken now giving the safety Vodafone safety car instruction on the restart. And one of the propeller head moments of the weekend is the crowd erupt. What a great atmosphere it is here. And the history, massive crowd 
enjoying a classically good day in Melbourne. We've had bad weather through the week, but it's a beautiful day today, just in the southeastern suburbs of Victoria, in the capital city. This is the home of motorsport, and the way that this works now for the co-drivers, as we said, is still the 54 laps. Two laps under safety car we're hearing before we commence this. So on the numbers that I'm projecting, it's now the Wilson Security 393. OK. Yeah. And uh, there won't be a pad change requirement now. Now, That's that in itself is actually yeah. you know, no big deal. You can go car racing without having to do that. What's not good about it, this is a rehearsal for Bathurst. And it would be ideal in the theatre of war to rehearse that prior to going to the biggest race of the year. So uh, we think 127 laps and uh, 390 odd k's and potentially the shortest in the long history of this event. 46th running of the Enduro at Sandown. You know what it does is it lifts the intensity because it becomes more of a sprint, sprint race. race. So the 54 lap component of the co-driver section primarily because the Van Gisbergen and Lowndes mobiles have got their primary drivers on, on, on board already. But it definitely makes a sprint race there, but it will make two stints of the 73 laps remaining for the lead drivers into absolute sprint drivers. Sprint What's race. all the gaps? Well, I, I actually don't know. They're supposed to be within five car lengths of each other, so some of them can't count. True. The uh, intensity now will also be such that there's potential for mistakes. So let's not forget that we probably haven't seen the last of the Vodafone safety car for the day either. So that's something else that's got to be taken into account. They really need to tighten the, this pack up. No doubt. This and is one of the other things. That it's, an, it's another line item to add to all of those co-driver remarks about making sure that you've got the intensity of that right. They're bringing Lowndes in for a driver change. Craig out, Richo in, and uh, the belt hasn't released, Murph. Yeah, they've uh, they've decided to uh, get Lounsey out of that car. It was a late call. Richo was still getting his gear on as okay, Lounsey was in the lane. So a late call for those guys to get uh, that strategy changed. They filled the car up and he's on his way. I, I think it's, it's smart. And Craig didn't actually get the belt knuckle fully released, so that was the reason why he couldn't get out. Oh, I think this is a good move. I think you put Steve in now, you do the 54 laps, and then you fire Craig in to sprint to the end. I think that's actually, again, thinking on your feet, probably not a bad call. As long as they can get back to the back of the grid here, OK. Your point before about the gaps, they've all closed up now. This is getting better. They're going to do their restart now. There's Simo, I was just saying before about his bad facial stuff going. And then on the other side of what goes on here, remember, if you go off the road, the propensity to get bogged now is really high. The amount of rain that we've had down here off at turn nine, down at turn 11 off, down at turn one, into turn three and four, easy to be parked. Stanaway has got control of the field. The safety car's gone into pit lane. Alex Premer behind in the shell car. Paul Dumbrell in the Red Bull Holden Racing Team car. Then it's Luke Yulden in the Erebus Penrite hold. Chris Pither is at the wheel of car number 99. As we go racing once more, an hour and seven minutes after the initial start, cold tyres, cold brakes, cold minds, and they have to warm to the task of racing very quickly. 126 laps now we're hearing, so one lap back from our original number. And a bit of a lazy restart for two or three of those there. There's big gaps already. Steve Owen was a long way behind Chris Pither. And young James Golding was a long way behind Tony Dalberto. Now a little bit of contact here with Ash Walsh into the back of Jonathan Webb. He got away with that one on the left-hand side as they get on to the back straight. Big, fast run up here. Jack Perkins on the outside of David Wall. We've seen drama up here already. And then David Wall, bit of discretion there. Break a little bit earlier and let Jack across the front. Van Gisbergen has moved up to 12 already. So one spot off the restart. Nice move here, Dalberto. Steve Owen stays. He'll have to do the crisscross. Golding now trying to park the Valvoline. Commodore down the inside. Can he get that made by the time they get to turn one? Will he be able to hold that position? 
No, he's just had to drop back in behind Dalberto. So there's a fairly good battle raging there with Dalberto, Golding and Ryder right in behind. It's Macaulay Jones just off the edge of the road. So there's only one of the primary drivers in the field now, everybody else with the green lights on. Co-drivers in the car, so it's Craig Lowndes, a uh, correction. I should say Shane Van Gisbergen is the only pr primary driver there. So we're making uh, 390 kilometres subject to any further safety car interventions for 126 laps of racing. It's a nice margin, Stanaway over Prema. Half a second, he's just cleared out in that first lap, taking a little bit of the pressure away from himself. And the point we were making at the restart with Steve Richards in the late call for the driver change is he didn't get to the back of the queue. He's actually nine seconds adrift of Dean Canto, so that's really hurt Steve Richards and Craig Lowndes. That was a good, you can see him in the background actually, you can see those cars going through there. Under the Penrite Bridge will be the Caltex Commodore. So you can see it now. So there's Jack Perkins leading that group, but in the background near the Coates higher side will be Steve Richards. So that's a big deficit. You've started the race nine seconds away from last. But you do have a clear track. And I think it was the right call. It reversed them out of potentially a little, little hole that they were backed into. Stanaway, Prema, Dumbrell, Yulden, Owen, Pitha, Dalberto, Golding, Reindler, Van Gisbergen up to 10th already. Shane's only 5.4 seconds from the lead of the race. So he can get to the lead of the race well and truly in the next 15 odd laps. On board here in car 12, this is Tony Delberto. Ten years since he was the Super 2 champion, Dunlop Super 2 champion, as it's now known. Fastest driver seg uh, track segment-wise at the moment out there is Paul Dumbrell. Nice move, Steve Owen, down the inside of Chris Pitha. And, and that was... A nice run off there for Dumbrell. He actually looked like he got onto the straight really nicely in behind Alex Premer also. I was going to say that he had a run on him and then at the end of the straight, come off, turn one very nicely. So nice exits for Paul Dumbrell. Let's just see what he can do because he needs to get by. Stanaway currently has a lead of just over one second on Alex Premer. Just shows the nose, not quite there to be able to pass. But he's in contention to get down the inside here. At this spot, he's in contention here and he gets it done. Can he stop it? Yes, he can. But does he stay there? Because Premer has been able to do the crisscross. Will Paul be able to get back down there? Not quite. So great racing, but that's a bump. That's a little bump, but great racing between those two guys. And Paul, Criticised himself yesterday for, driver, mate. Long ahead. Eyes doing a great job. for running wide at the end of the back straight twice and plunging down on the grass and the mud down there. So showing a lot of aggression early. He's getting on with it. But you've got to be super careful. Look at this. They're three wide in the run down towards turn one. Carl Reindler in the foreground. And the squeeze is on. Golding in car number 33, sharing with Garth Tander. Dean Fiore in car number 23. 34 is Richard Musket. Macaulay Jones in there as well. This is the outside of turn four where there's already those wheel tracks that had Dean Cando off at the start of the race. Gee, they did a good job to get through there, those guys. That, well, I know there was two teammates involved in it. One on the inside was Dean Fiore. And nice presence of mind. Nice amount of racing room that they were given little bump but nothing catastrophic from what looked like three abreast into turn one always bad little break lock up there for Golding he was around the outside he actually did a nice job to maintain his track position here comes Luff on the outside of Macaulay Jones can he stay there he does nice move runs him a little bit wide that's a bit of gamesmanship but the old head on Warren Luff there to push Macker a little bit wide and at the end of that James sorry Jack Perkins was able to then get a nice run he'll get down the inside also 
it's hard to change those uh, instinctive names when you see those numbers. They're not even colours today because of retro. Now Van Gisbergen's up to eighth position at the moment. He's six seconds from the lead. We're riding with him. He's all over the back of Tony Delberto. So he's storming through the field. Remember, qualified 19th plus two grid penalties. So out of 21st, sitting in eighth, threatening to make a move here. This has been the problematic area this weekend, just to the right where all the trouble unfolded yesterday and earlier in this race. Now Van Gisbergen will have a look up the inside here into the last right-hander. Not quite close enough, he wriggled it in on the oh. rear break. Dalberto knew he was there. He's looking to try and maximise corner exit speed. Sits up on top of the concrete ramp. And he'll have another look down the inside when they get down here at turn one. He may get some benefit from the draft here. That's Pither in the foreground, car number 99. He's looking. Yep. Not close enough. So good presence of mind by Delberto to just stay on the racing line, the fastest way around the racetrack. Clean under brakes down there. Break it in there as deep as possible and still able to hold his ground. And that's 100%, Neil. Too many of the co-drivers find themselves in the position where they have to cover. And by balking or covering that line, you slow both of you down. So Tony's basically said, look, Shane, if you're fast enough to get by me, go your hardest. And uh, that's a good way to go about it as they come off this big, fast right-hander down to down on road. This is probably the spot, and he does do it. Tony saw him coming. Nice driving by both parties. Well done. Now, in the foreground, Pitha had the wheels locked, and he was running wide. And is now vulnerable. He'll lose the spot to Van Gisberg, and there's two spots, and Delberto wants a piece of the action as well. So Shane Van Gisbergen now grabs two spots in the process to position number six, clear track for him. 12 runs complete, position six. Delberto now on the inside of Pitha. He had the pole from Queensland Raceway last year. Tony's ideally positioned here and is far enough up to get it done. Yeah, nice driving. So Chris paying the penalty for the lockup at turn nine at Danny Nong Road. Tries to crisscross into two. That was close. We both flinched. Carl Reindler's in behind. Fabian Coulthard watching his man in eighth position there at the moment. Nice driving, Delberto. And that was uh, very close, the manoeuvre with Chris Pither. But have a look at this pass. You know, you'll just see the little wheel lock. So that's Chris having a moment. In behind is Shane, who makes a, a nice dive. Delberto gave him room. And then as they come off here, Shane had a little faint to the left, cleverly. Faint it to the left, dive to the right. So he gets down there. Chris was actually trying to block him. Couldn't quite get it done. He knew how serious that Shane was. He probably actually knew that that was Van Gisberg. And they would have told him on the radio and said, you know, he's coming. And here we are now back at the front of the field. Stand away, meantime. 2.2 second lead. There's the gap you can see over Alex Prema. Dumbrell hasn't been able to do anything with Alex Prema at this stage. He looks like he's got better pace. But he hasn't been able to find a way past. There has to be some urgency in the Van Gisbergen game, and the reason is that he's going to have to get back in again later, so it's a, it's two two driver changes for them. And you heard me say in the Hino Hub, ideally today you only want to crack that door open once. Co-driver out, primary driver in. So getting into a commanding position, giving some cushion to Matt Campbell is going to be very important if they're going to be able to recover. And when that happens, the way the race is going to pan out now, they're going to be shorter fuel stops. So as soon as you make shorter fuel oh, stops, here we go. Luke Gilden off in the weeds, well off. Get so Steve off. Owen was the one down the inside. That's a big loss of ground. Peter cleans him up as well. So he'll have a bit of water, mud, dirt, grass, garbage on those tyres. And now he's got Rindle right behind him. Here comes PD Dumbrell down the inside, looking at Prema. Mike working on it, and this time, you can see it just wriggling in on the rear brake, and he's got it done. So that's up to P2, position two now, Paul Dumbrell. And remember, this is the battle for the championship. These two guys are first and second, or these two cars, with McLaughlin 
and Winker battling for the championship. That's young Maddie Campbell getting ready. So on those two short films, they're going to have to do a driver change twice, which is your point. That's that's a big risk. Here's what happened to Luke Gilden from the point of view of Steve Owen, who came down the inside. There must have been contact, Bang. and that's what sent him out into the weeds there. So he's fully alongside. Here's the view from external down there and uh, doesn't take much to just get that nudge off the road and then the recovery takes so long he'd be wheel spinning frantically trying to get back on here's the rear bumper cam view and it looked like he was down there far enough didn't it, it looked like it was a nice pass and again it always takes two to tango with this because at some stage luke needs to you listen to the wheel spin how wet it is as i was saying earlier you could easily bog yourself out there and this is the replay of the nice pass. Have a look at the little bit of rear locking and a little bit of instability there for Dumbrell as he makes that manoeuvre stick at turn one. And again, nice driving by Alex Kramer. It's well wide at turn one down there. And who is it? 62 it is, so it's Alex Davison. And he has to come back through that little artificial chicane that's been created with the cone markers there. You're not allowed to pop back on between turns one and two. Fair penalty today given how wet it is in the outfield. <laughs> and, a fair, and a fair task. You might not even get through it. You might not even get there. <laughs> you need the four-wheel drive on exactly. standby parked out there. Meantime, car number 56 has been in and out of the pit lane as well. Here's the replay of what happened and this is... Penalty at next pit stop for car 55 for a driving injury trouble. So time penalty car 55. Steve, Steve Owen. Owen. I presume that's for turn nine. It is. Five second penalty. That's a hold at the next stop. So that's an interesting one. That is an interesting one. I'm it will be for, uh, it, it's probably on the basis of no racing room. So Yulden had nowhere to go, to go, I'm guessing. Stanaway's got the the lead and he's got a nice one 1.9 seconds over Dumbrell and then Alex Premer Steve Owen is in fourth but he's got a five second time penalty hovering over him for his stop then Van Gisberg in fifth how's that what a great performance it underlines the intensity of how good the primary runners are when they're so car confident they spend so much time in these vehicles Dalberto sixth Pitt the seventh Luke Gilden then Carl Reindler James Golding that's the ten you outlined earlier that there is hardly a driver combination that you could say has equal pace. And that example of Van Gisbergen coming from the back of the field and getting to there, you can see him now pretty much in contact with the leaders, is the demonstration of one of the best guys in the category basically playing as a, as a primary driver against the co-drivers. So that's not taking anything away from those lead people. And there's a... Tire damaged for car 62 right rear. I don't know whether that was. Oh, that, that wheel's not back on. Back up. I'm sorry, Rusty. Let's dive into uh, the Pro Drive Racing Australia pit to talk to Chaz Mossett. How do you feel? What's your take on the, the five second penalty for Steve? Oh, it doesn't matter what I think at the end of the day, they make their own rules out there. Look, you know, I think Steve did a good move. He, he was in control up, up the inside there, and, um, you know, it's, it's, that corner always takes two people to get through it cleanly. So uh, he didn't uh, shuffle him out. You know, everyone, generally the outside guy, runs up on the curb to give room anyway, but the contact was made around the corner, so it's a bit, a bit weird to see. So, yeah, I don't, I don't agree with it, but I, don't, I can't really have a say anyway, so it doesn't matter. Thanks, little rooster. Yeah, well, I've been wrong both times because I thought that was fine. And, and it does take two to tango. The guy on the outside's got to understand when you've got to put the white flag up. And uh, based on my assessment of the Jack Perkins Canto one, he's like, you're not going to have his fingers jammed in that rear guard yeah. and that tyre then, with, with that uh, tyre being replaced. And there's the damage when it was on track. No wheel now, so that's, come, that's actually come off so subsequent to the stop. I, so what's happened is the wheel hasn't seated on the drive pegs done the wheel nut up and then as soon as it's taken off the wheel shifted on the drive pegs and the nuts come adrift as car number five comes in Dean Canto 
sharing with Mark Winterbottom. So Alex Davis creeping along up the back straight. He's got that old Phil Monday panel works livery on that car number 62. And uh, all the drivers out there being warned about the slow car. That'll be a real difficult thing to handle over the top of the hill and down the other side to the slow corner at turn nine. For sure. When everybody's arriving at walk pack five. Absolutely. That's absolutely right. And have a look at the, at the ground that Dumbrell's taken off Stanaway. And how close was that coming in? We said it earlier in the day. It's one of the one of the hardest spots to, to not collect someone who's coming into the pit when you're hard in the throttle sliding the car and someone checks up in front of you. So that was very close. But this is the gap and the lead of the race. Dumbrell to stand away. Have a listen to this on the car 55 radio. And remember the penalty here. Five seconds extra before he can be released. Looking at the stopwatch. Go, go, go. And this is about getting Steve Owen to lap 54. So coming in because they don't have that much range in them fuel-wise. Car number 34, Richard Musket, same deal. David Wall as well. They've got about 40-odd laps of range in them out of 110-litre tank as Alex Davison limps back with that right rear. It's a good call to just turn it down the inside and stay away from the apex. Alex done a lot of racing here and overseas. Oh! I thought they were going to run into each other then. I thought there was going to be contact. Beautiful driving by both parties there. So lap 21. So it's the same deal here. And so Dumbrell shadowing. This is going to be a bit of a pressure stop for both crews here. And Davison safely back in the lane in 62. Yeah, Paul Dumbrell's just about to pull into the Rebel Horn Racing Team spot. Obviously staying in the car, we know that. But the strategy, having to get those 54 laps of fuel is connected nicely. No changes from what I can see. And a very clean set of tyres going on the car. So just waiting for fuel now. Nice clean stop for the double eight. So changing position. Probably the undercut on on a fuel strategy there it was going to get him into the lead, wasn't it? So check this out for the near miss. You were calling it. Yeah, I held my breath because I thought this was going to result in contact. In fact, <laughs> so did Shane Van Gisbergen. So he came well out of the throttle there. Like he had to have the full lift off there. He went to zero percentage. Whew. Seen a couple of shunts there over the years. You made the point before about how quick pit lane entry arrives on you when you come out of the final corner and then you've got to get yourself organised into the pit lane, activate the pit lane speed limiter. So track position vital there for car number 88. Very important part of today's story for Paul Dumbrell. Luke Gilton in now car number 9. Tony Delberto car number 12. Carl Reidler car number 18. Jack Perkins is in now as well. Now let the games begin because this is the start of strategy. Right height, right height adjustment yep. for Luke Gilton. The back of that car and departed. Does he get out in front of him? No, not quite. So again, primarily all the co-drivers stay in the cars, except for Van Gisbergen. They're going to get to lap 54 as a minimum. They may go longer. They've got flexibility in that regard. These are the two guys that worked together last year for these races. And Shane around the outside. Beautiful move. Great driving by both guys again because Alex Prima could have run him wide. And puts him in the lead. Oh, and, and in. And in. There you go. That was a pass, so, pass for the pit. A lot of energy expended <laughs> for a uh, very short-lived lead. In fact, it probably doesn't even appear on the micro sectors. <laughs> I haven't seen that before, have you? I've never seen that before. <laughs> so Shane Gisbergen on the mark nicely. He gets out of the way. Matt Campbell throws his seat insert and goes into the 97. There's a green set of fronts on the 97 car they've just got on. That'll be something to be wary of for Matt Campbell when he gets down to turn one, that those front tyres are not roaded whatsoever. It's a short stop, obviously. It's not a full tank of fuel. And he is away. So keep an eye on Matt Campbell down at turn one. They did something on the front of Van Gisbergen's car. Yeah, they put, put some tape on it. Yeah, put some yeah. race tape over a bonnet pin. 
it looked like. I didn't see what uh, exactly if it was the damage or the, what the pin was, but I did see them put the tape on there. Yeah, there see if you can follow it up for us. But Copy that. See what the story is there. So uh, interesting that one. So here's the big move. We got all excited about this. This is effectively for the lead of the race from 21st, Shane Van Gisberg. And how's that for a performance? Bit of safety car along the way. Round the outside in the second last corner at 11. And uh, <laughs> here we go out of turn nine. Watching from Shane's viewpoint from up on the roof here. I've seen this done quite a few times because it puts you in the perfect position when you get to turn 12. There is another little kink we count called 13 after that, but it's basically the last corner. And then 25 metres later, all over Red Rover, we're in the pit lane. Uh, <laughs> we've been uh, laughing all weekend about the way we explained the grid format for the weekend and how that works, but sprint for the pits is a different one <laughs> for now. That's the way that worked just then. That was a big dive. And Ooh. straight into the pit. What was interesting there was how much wheel spin Prema had coming out of turn nine. He had a lot of wheel spin for this this late in the game. In other words, warm tyres on that tyre stint. And then in. And, that's... and, and in fact, uh, half a chance to have drilled him there. So what are, what are they wrestling with here on that bonnet pin on the front left-hand corner and why? Is it just damage? Boys, I've uh, got the answer for you on that one. Um, but the issue was, was the ring here on the bonnet clip, this one had just popped out of uh, the uh, edge there, so it had come out and they couldn't get it back in. So the bonnet pin is still in the car and closed, but they just put a piece of tape over it just in case anything happened. Yeah, good plan. Security, thanks for the update, Murph. Well chased. You'd have a lot of those in New Zealand, wouldn't you, Murph? <laughs> Bent bonnet pins. Yeah. It's a bit harsh. <laughs> Especially when he doesn't have right of reply. <laughs> Stephen Richards and uh, David Russell in now as well. Fastest lap of the race, by the way, Alex Premer has done a 1 minute 9.6. He did that pretty early on. Macaulay Jones is actually the leader now. All three wheels and tyres are doubling, just waiting on the right rear. All four wheels and tyres are done, so you are good to go. Nice communication, isn't it? Oh, the way they go about it. No panic, nice and slow. All happens very systematic. The other thing that's got to be managed at this racetrack is just cleanly feeding back out of the pit lane onto the track itself too. Witness mark on the front left corner, car number 97. Some scuff marks on there, and we clearly see the race tape holding that bonnet pin in place. Jonathan Webb's now the leader. Macaulay Jones has come in. I just pulled Jones as the leader. There's only one car out there now that actually hasn't taken its first stop, and that is Jonathan Webb. There's Macaulay. That's the Nick Perkett car in Norm Beachy colours. resetting the fuel so there's so much to do on the way out of the pit and obviously you've got to organize yourself when you have had the driver change to make sure that all the belts are done and your air duct is back in place and reset the bars reset the brake bias reset the fuel so that the team understand what the fuel numbers are so there's a lot of work in a very short space of time and then what Neil said before is important is to get the guidance from your crew as to where you land on the track, so McC uh, McCauley's just made a little mistake there on cold tyres, and can he gather it back up again? Yes, he does. Good job. Now a little bit of contact with Dean Fiore. Dean gets that Calsonic Nissan celebrating the GDR colours of the early 90s. And Mr. Rashino was one of the superstar drivers of Japanese racing of those days. He was the Bridgestone GDR man, won so many of the All Japan titles. He was one of the lead drivers for the Motor Company for many years and there's Naka just out breaking himself a little bit. The other car in behind, which was Jack Perkins, probably enticed him in there. He knew that he had to be quite deep under brakes to maintain that spot. Dean's trying to get around the outside there. A little bit of wheel-to-wheel -wheel contact and this is the 
example of the right front and left rear contact. Let's hope that there's no tyre or wheel damage to either car, Rihanna. Yeah, just tidy up some of those pit stops. Chris Pipper, he had to pit earlier than expected. He had a left front puncture, and it was also a right rear puncture that sent Alex Davison off the track in the first place. So a couple of early punctures for those guys. Replay there, car number 22 actually nudged up on the wall because they've got it they're not allowed to bleed across to the middle lane there they've got to stay in the fast lane uh, as he's come back he's actually given a water clout uh, no further action the incident between cars 56 and 75 to 9 lap 14. the other thing that needs explaining is our leader at the moment is ash walsh who's showing the stop you got to wind your thoughts all the way back to the kerfuffle at the start remember he got involved in ash was at turn four in all the drama early on and uh, so this is uh, what I was just talking about before no further action with those two it seemed like there was less drama with the previous Steve Owen dive down the inside with Yulden to me anyway I'll I'm going to stay right out of that today now, but no further action with those two guys. So just going back to explaining the Ash Walsh uh, lead position at the moment. So he's got to uh, he's got to the lead because he pitted the end of lap one. So remember, he was in all the trouble with Taz Douglas. Got turned around out at turn four, came in and put fuel in it. So out of sequence, showing a stop, but leading the race at the moment. And then, in reality, it's Paul Dumbrell as the corrected leader now and that was very impressive run from him and great work in the pit lane by red bull holden racing team they'll be a strong combo from this point on and on that topic they pretty much are a double a combination aren't they so win cup dumbrell pace wise and certainly because of the amount of work that he's doing in dunlop super 2 that's also very handy for Paul Dumbrell. He's doing a lot of sweating in that helmet, isn't he? There's a lot of work going on all year round so that when he gets to these key races, and he'd be filthy with himself on what happened here last year, so there'd be very high levels of determination to correct what happened with that okay, seatbelt yeah, mistake. flag and yeah. a pit lane drive-through penalty for car 62 for a unsafe release uh, from pit lane in an unsafe uh, condition. Sorry, a release from pit lane in an unsafe condition. There are additional penalties which have been advised to the team. So that's for Alex Davison for that drum with that right rear wheel. Dropped it off the jacks before it was fastened in place. Sent the car and then the wheel settled onto the drive pegs properly. And process of wobbling around and through the wheel not off the wheels part of the company so you can't do that so there's a penalty there and there'll also be a fine so it's pit lane drive through penalty 30 team points at five thousand dollars which obviously shows the severity of how the sport deems the wheel coming off there's miss murph working hard just cruising there on the outside Got anything to report there at all, Murph? Or you just... No. <laughs> yeah. I actually thought I heard a car earlier, boys. That actually uh, sounded running like it was running a bit rough. But uh, so I'm on the on the fence with my my eagle ear trying to pick it. It's but 20, I think it's all okay. It's 25 out there. There's, I'm not sure whether you. I, is there 25 out there? Is there? Are you sure about that? <laughs> Are you sure you want to count them? <laughs> I'm wasted if there's not. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, that's funny. So, the battle continues. As you said, Doug Brown did a really good job. They slightly, from a strategic standpoint, underfilled versus Pro Drive with Stanaway for the undercut and to get Paul Dumbrell into clear air. And he's got almost a six second lead, Dumbrell now over Stanaway, who then has roughly six seconds to Prema and then only a second to Matt Campbell, who is now on board with car 97. What a great job Shane Van Gisbergen did in that first stint. And we, we made the comment a few years ago when we watched Jamie Winkup come from last to first in the first stint of a race at Bathurst and said what a magnificent drive that was. Today you can put Van Gisbergen's effort right up there with that. It's a great drive, got through the field, minimal contact, minimal damage, and 
asserted his authority throughout the course of those opening laps and to get the 13th on the opening lap was unbelievable and then be able to carve through the rest of the field finally put a nice move on Alex Prema before he shot into the into the pit and put young Matt Campbell on board car 97 and I'm watching Campbell's lap speed at the moment relative to Alex Prema and Tony Delberto either side of him at the moment just want to get an understanding remember that he's driving in Porsche Super Cup living and based in Europe not spending time in a supercar and Friday would be compromised for him by the amount of wet weather running so it's a big task for him it looks pretty good his last lap in fact was just fractionally quicker than Alex Prema and in fact faster than Tony Delberto so just store that one away it's worth keeping an eye on so he's on corrected at the moment Dumbrell Stanaway Campbell uh, the quickest out there and in fact on the last lap Campbell was the fastest out there so that's pretty good speed so worth filing that one this is great telemetry now as you can see the brake application the amount of throttle percentage you see them wind onto the back straight these your numbers in terms of how fast they're going what gear they're in and get up to this amazing bit of road 260k wind direction very much dependent up there can make about 10k difference from a tire wind or a headwind and then down to the Dandenong Road which is the corner on Dandenong Road on the Princess Highway in Melbourne southeast suburbs of Melbourne and the way that the car comes onto the straight you can hear the throttle lag and just trying to get the car nice and straight before he was full throttle again and a beautiful run down this big long main straight what a great place it is for spectators to watch this because you can be in the grandstand and pretty much see the whole facility this is an intense and important battle with these guys in this group here at the moment Owen Yield and Love Canto line astern and that's 10 11 12 13 and for Owen and Yulden, it's a resumption of play because they got together up at turn nine earlier on and involved, in, uh, involved that uh, stop and hold penalty. Canto all over the back of Luff on the run up to turn six. They're actually good, quite good mates, these guys. Dean Canto and Warren Luff, so they'll be enjoying the little bump and grind they've got going there with classic Ford and Holden battle with Pro Drive versus number one HSB racing and a little bit wide there for Yield and he approaches that last corner looks like some fuel checking there by supercars officials yeah there's Craig Haystead doing some numbers sampling taking random fuel samples of shell racing fuel which is good battle on here Premer and Campbell made mention of it before. So the split in the first timing intermediate for both of them, nothing in it, absolutely nothing in it. And uh, in terms of pace on the last lap, the fastest was Paul Dunbrell, second fastest Matt Campbell, third fastest Richard Stanaway. So Stanaway doing another outstanding job year on year, building on what he achieved yesterday. Uh, stated the fact that he wants to be aiming for a full-time ride in the series in 2018. Been driving Aston Martin in the world, for Aston Martin in the World Endurance Championship and driving successfully. Young Kiwi. This is a really good battle here between these two. So looking at position number four and five here, Alex Prema and Matt Campbell. Matty's already had some wins overseas this year. He earned the right to get that Porsche Super Cup drive. Carrera Cup winner last year in Australia. It's a really good story. It's a great export story. And as soon as uh, Alex Premel wasn't available, Roland Dane clinched that deal with Matt Campbell straight away to partner him with Shane Van Gisbergen. And on, on the evidence here, he's well and truly a worthy competitor because it was <laughs> Prema that was with that team last oh. year. Trouble here. Failed right rear tyre. Drama for Dumbrell. You saw them laying up at Red Bull. Is that as a result of settings, contact, or something else? 
And that's your effective leader, remember? Ash Walsh is going to be in shortly. He's not going to make his 54 laps. He's got to stay in Dumbrell. Clearly hasn't done the number of laps prescribed. So he's got to come in. He's looking great. Presence of mind there by Paul to be looking at where the next car is and how he can do this. You've got to get the car back safely. He's using all of the edge of the road there nicely to take the load off the car and get it into pit lane. But that's a big failure and, and again, a real story. A real story to unfold because if they've had problems, others will too. And David, David Couch, he just, after I asked him any warning at all, he just shook his head in absolute dis disgust and disappointment at what's happened here. Doesn't look like, from what I can see, guys, that uh, any other damage under there. Obviously, the, the tire that's come apart and sort of sawed away at the guard there, but uh, it all looks intact and no other damage that's going to happen after uh, that change. So a green set of tires gone on that car, but no uh, sort of anything that led into them to believe it was a problem. It's weird, isn't it, Berth? Because this is not a place where you run mad cambers. No, it's not, not a at circuit all. that you run really big rear negative camber so I get but again it is a place you use a lot of exit curb so you have a lot of curb on the way out of the final corner a lot of curb at turn one a lot of curb at turn four a fair bit of curb on the way out of turn nine so maybe a little bit of structural damage to the tire as a consequence of the there's the curb that I'm saying out of turn one and they probably already said to Matt Campbell let's use less curb now, it's coming up the straight. This is the replay of the car doing this. We've seen these tyre failures. This is, as I said, the, the course of the lead because you can see Stanaway in behind. And there's the failure. Very, very quick. And no warning, as you heard Greg Murphy report from David Couchy. No warning. There's the car running up the back straight. And bang. Very strange. It may just be a puncture. I mean, it can be less, less problematic than that. Yeah, especially given the, I think you've hit the nail on the head. So it looks like he's even feeling something here as he came out of turn four. So he's just hesitating straight away. So it may have been further back on the curbing. Exit of turn one, you abuse the exit curbs and then you're giving them a fair hammering at two and three as well. He looked like he was off the throttle, didn't he? Interesting to see here because this is, this is what we were saying. This is a lot of exit curb and this big bump off here. Bang! that there that is very aggressive and what I'm interested to pick up on there's Jamie Winkup looking on uh, is the is the exit out of turn four when we were on board we heard the throttle come off didn't we so it was like he knew it but it hadn't been reported and there was no radio chat at that stage they're also getting uh, yeah there's the view of the area that we're talking about on the exit of turn one so that curb extension just stops abruptly there in this little dig out behind it. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, they're also getting uh, live tyre pressure feeds, so they may have already seen something in the garage at that point as well. Uh, but he was off the gas when he came out of turn four. David Couchy said that he didn't, he didn't get any warning. So again, it sounded like Paul had some warning, Murph. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I just watched the in-car there of him missing that apex there onto the back straight, boys. But the other thing is, obviously, with the tyre pressures, the team's trying to run the pressures low as they can. We've got the minimum, obviously, but on the outlaps on a new set of tyres, you'll probably remember, you know, when we were driving even, you know, stay off those curbs, guys, too, so we don't do any damage to the to the tyres. And I just asked Mark Dutton, is that obviously part of the process for you guys? And they said, yes, definitely. On the first lap or so, trying to stay away from the curb, so maybe that could have uh, contributed to it if one of them had uh, or if he had hit something uh, early on on that last stint. Yeah, for sure. And, and we we were saying that we didn't really pick up on anything, but we're just about to watch some in-car. And we've got... Just have a listen for this because we'll see how much Kirby uses there. That looks normal. No, it doesn't look normal now. Oh. So it didn't look normal from three to four, and then he's backed it off. Yeah, so yep. on the run between three and four, it cocked sideways as though the right rear had failed at that point. So I suspect that uh, either damage was done earlier, as Greg pointed out, or it may have even been as it left over that hole at turn one. They go out and you saw them pressuring tyres in the garage there before at Dick Johnson Racing Team Penske. 
The minimum tyre pressure is 17 pounds. The hot tyre pressures are in the order of 30. Every team's got its own theory on what optimises performance. So I'm using the old language with pounds here. As we look at Jack Perkins, car number 22, and he's tucked right in behind Warren Luffy's teammate. Their line is stern at the moment, 12th and 13th. Crompo, their rivals further down the lane. DJR Team Penske watched all of those replays very, very closely. And there was a group of them that were gathered around the monitors, including Fabian Coulthard, Scott McLaughlin, uh, even Stephen Johnson was in there along with the uh, the engineering group. Ryan Story just told me they warned their drivers earlier in the weekend about keeping off those curbs. They haven't re-warned them since, but they were surprised at the pace Paul Dumbrell had and how hard their rivals at Red Bull were going at that stage. And Dumbrell has the fastest lap of the race at 1 minute 9.6. He did it, uh, well, in fact, he's just improved on it. He did it the last lap, lap 38. But prior to that, he also had the fastest lap, which he did on lap 20. The problem is, is it's nice to warn the drivers about that, but you can't warn them properly because you actually have to qualify on those tyres. So you can't be nice over the kerbs when you've leapt out of the pit area on a green tyre trying to do the best lap. You use a massive amount of kerb in qualifying. So it might be that you've got to say, right, oh, just be careful in the race with that. But in qualifying, there is no way that you can't do an optimal lap without using plenty of curb. One of the reasons why they take so much detail on their track walk on Thursday is also to survey all of that information around the racetrack so they look at all those things carefully, make notes, go back in to debrief and discuss it. Incidentally, that was a change for the lead, the Freightliner car, number 75 this weekend instead of the regular 14, and yellow instead of its regular colours, white and red. So celebrating Norm Beachy's retro colours there, but uh, Ash stopped early. Here's the pass for the lead on board with Richie Stanaway. So slightly out of sequence with the car that we're riding with at the moment. Got much better drive out of the final corner and was easily able to go up the inside. So Stanaway over Prema is 5.6 seconds. There's a little either a thumbs up or something there from Richie Stanaway across to Ash Walsh when they come onto the straight there. Now, I don't think it was anything aggressive. I think it was a bit of mateship as we watch Dean Fiore just eating a nice move there on Jacobson down at Dandenong Road. In behind is Macaulay Jones. In behind is Jonathan Webb. And the thing for Ash Walsh, which I was trying to explain before the drama with Dumbrell, was that he's in a difficult predicament for Brad Jones Racing based on the laps that he's done having to come in shortly, isn't he? Because he's, he's will have done the 54 shortly, but he's got to do effectively an extra stint. So probably more like half race for Ash Walsh. Watching this battle pack headed at the moment by Macaulay Jones. It's for 16. Our race leader, Richie Stanaway, has got three seconds over Ash Walsh. 5.2 seconds over Alex Premer. And car number seven, Jack LeBrock, just made a little bit of ground there up into 18th place now. That's Stephen Richards in the Caltex Craig Lowndes car. Okay, Gary Jacobson, car number 56. So on lap number 43, minimum laps required 54. Pit one window actually opens on uh, lap 40 for some. So Stanaway's got really good pace out there at the moment. And if anything, is just slowly but surely beginning to open that gap, Rusty. I just wanted into Gary Rogers' motorsport crompo on James Golding, and I've seen Garth Tander. He's got uh, a radio set of headphones on. He's been listening very closely to what James has been saying during the race. Now, he's not happy... Uh, with the amount of drive that he's getting out of the 33 at the moment. So uh, Richard Holway is contemplating a change potentially at the next stop to try and improve things. But on balance, given the headline sort of start to his Sandown 500 last year, he's been doing a really good job chipping away, doing it nicely in the top 10. Thanks for the update. Alex Premer now also rounding up Ash Walsh. And so is Matt Campbell. Uh, so that now makes the order... Stanaway, Prema and Campbell with Walsh now in fourth position. And a further amendment to what I said a moment ago. Fuel window opens now. Pit open on lap 41. So basically he could come in now if he wanted to. But 
really the reality is that for people other than the those that are shuffling the primary drivers in and out they want to get to lap 54 and then tick off that part of the strategic scenario get that job done get the primary driver in there and then just go hard to the end and it may not even suit them then they'll, they'll if there's a safety car in and around that or they right. run to whatever that time is but uh it will be interesting to see how they play that out when they get their co-drivers out and the primary drivers in. That Dumbrell puncture or tyre failure has actually cost them a net roughly 50 seconds. And maybe less than that in the end, but on track he had a six second lead and he's made some ground back up, but he's roughly 51 seconds away from Stanaway now. So it's a uh, 50 second penalty for the tyre failure. We're looking back to Canto, who's right up in behind Yulden, who's just resting the front of the Falcon on the back of the Commodore. He'll probably dive to the right. He's been blocked a little bit, but can he get down there? No. So, already been quite aggressive in the braking area for turn 11. Nice exit by Yulden there, and actually made the car get away. So Stanaway, Prama, Campbell, Dalberto, Reinler, Musket, Golding, Owen, Yulden, Canto. That's your top ten. That little battle that you were just looking at a second ago, just in behind is Luff and Perkins. The ride height change there for Ash Walsh. So that's maximum range on that tank, knowing that there'd been a safety car and a top up there as well. Look at this exchange. It's all going on. Bit of damage on that Luff right front bonnet as well. Battle pack continues. That, that, that's a fair old crease in the bonnet on Warren Luff's car as well, tucked in behind Luke Yulden. I think it might have been worse after the contact that Yulden, he went off and Luff made contact with Yulden off turn two and three. So they just made another little bump there. A lot of wheel spin now for Luke Yulden. He's really struggling with exit drive and he's in serious trouble in terms of being vulnerable